Hello, everyone. I hope uh, we are, yes, we are, we are uh, uh, on the air. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it is a privilege, joy, and an honor for us, for West University of Timisoara, and more particularly the Institute for uh, Social and Political Research, which uh, I am leading uh, at the moment. My name is uh, Florin Labonte. I am a professor uh, at this uh, particular university, Department of uh, Philosophy and Communication Studies. And um, after a long, uh, fairly long and fruitful collaboration with uh, Professor Stefan Lorenz Zorgner, who visited us and uh, gave uh, lectures here in a, on a number of times, both uh, in a face-to-face -face format before, before the pandemic started and uh, then during the pandemic uh, several times. Uh, he as he uh, also was our guest in, in several occasions, uh, speaking to students and uh, doctoral students, uh, academics. Uh, so now we can say that we have already built um, a tradition of collaboration, and it's my pleasure to um, actually um, introduce you to this uh, this um, streaming event which brings together very important names in the domains of transhumanism, posthumanism, metahumanism, and um, uh, associated fields worldwide. And I hope this is going to be a very, um, very fruitful, a very informative um, discussion, a debate which will last um, for several hours with, uh, with some, a break uh, in between. I hope you have already seen the, the program of the event uh, with the speakers, with their, with their teams, uh, but more of that uh, will be announced by our moderators. We have uh, a moderator for the morning session, a moderator for the afternoon session, so I, I, won't, I won't steal their jobs. Um, I I only wanted to introduce you to the uh, to the um, um, say main main uh, uh, player of this event, which is uh, Stefan Lorenz Orner, and uh, the topic of the of the debate today will be his his book on transhumanism, a book uh, the translation the, the translation of which was um, um, re released in. Uh, um, 2021, actually, uh, by uh, Pennsylvania University Press. The translator was uh, Spencer Hawkins, a book which uh, already found its place within the, um, the ever-growing uh, domain of transhumanist studies and already uh, triggered a lot of debate. The book, which um, has like five, five chapters, and uh, I hope that most of you have already had a chance to see it. It has been um, published in German in 2016. Now uh, it is also available in English, will be the subject of, of the discussions today. Because time, the time is not um, that generous with us considering the um, the, the length, uh, considering the, the richness uh, of uh, the um, uh, the idea of ideas and uh, topics which are going to be debated today, I uh, would not uh, will spend more time in discussing discussing introductory uh, generalities, and will uh, gladly. Um, give the floor already, or the microphone rather now, uh, to Stefan, who would um, uh, co-introduce this event uh, for all of you. I want to salute everyone and thank you for being with us here uh, on this um, uh, special day for us, uh, for West University of Timisoara, for transhumanism in general, for our guests, for everyone who, who loves transhumanism uh, and philosophy. Thank you. Oh. 
Many thanks, uh, Florian, for this kind introduction, for organizing the event. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, I think it's an incredibly important to reflect upon the various transhumanist issues. That's why I've sort of tried to, to move on the field for quite a few years. I mean, it all started actually, I've organized conferences on that topic um, already in 2009 and um, dealing with it uh, even earlier. But at that time, so 10, 15 years ago, there was a, a lot of hesitation concerning transhumanism in the fields of academia. And it's still the case that sort of people wonder whether it's not just a field or transhumanism is something which is being affirmed maybe by some geeks in Silicon Valley, some billionaires who are just interested in making more money. Isn't it just a support of the big industry? Is that really something, is transhumanism something, really something which should be taken seriously in academia? Um, or when the notion of the post-human comes up in the, sort of the academic context, it's, it's usually the case that people think about critical post-humanism, sort of that tradition going back to Donna Haraway, Catherine Hales, as an outcrowd of postmodern th theory. And there's sort of some connection, but that's some connection to transhumanism, but it's, it's a different kind of approach. However, when, when you hear the notion of the post-human in, in the wider, you know, like in the, public, in the public field, then most people think about transhumanism and think about Elon Musk and, and think about correlated developments and emerging technologies. So there's really a split between sort of the public reception of transhumanism and the, and the reception within academia. And within academia, there has been an enormous hesitation to, to take transhumanism seriously as a field worthy of in investigation. And, and I think it is. And, and, and that's sort of what, what triggered me personally in trying to promote the field further and reflecting on these issues. Um, and there was once a saying that uh, how, how, how bioethics saved the life of, of ethicists saved the life of philosophers because now they were able to demonstrate that their reflections really have a relevance in the life world. And um, this, this also goes actually for transhumanists. And I think in a, even in a, in a more stronger fashion, so it's not just the field of ethics, but transhumanism really covered the entire range of philosophical issues from sort of ethics, uh, ontology, epistemology, uh, logic. Um, so it's it's a wider take, a wider wider sense. It really is, is a, it's a challenge to all the criteria to the dominant paradigm, which has been dominant in the in the dualist humanist tradition in which we've all grown up in. So basically, sort of that dualist understanding of of anthropology, this dualist essentialism, which has been dominant in the in the history of philosophy for for 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years, at least since Plato. Um, it, and, and this is still taken for granted today. And this is at least still sort of at least the dominant conception among many people, both in philosophy, but as well in a broader audience, at least sort of in, in the encrusted structure of our cultural surroundings. Sort of if you look at, if you look at the, and the legal constitutions in various places of the world. It's still the case that if only we humans, we have a special field in the world. We humans possess dignity. We humans, we, we are persons. Animals are, are things or animals are supposed to be treated like things. And, and here we can see the relics of this dualist, essentialist, uh, humanist tradition, which, you know, it has been founded, established, uh, at least uh, by Plato, and even in the philosophical tradition, one can see only very few ex exceptions of philosophers who took a different stand. I mean, there have been philosophers like Heraclitus, like like Spinoza, like Nietzsche, um, but they were they do not represent the dominant paradigm. They don't re represent. Um, sort of the majority of philosophers who've dominated the way of thinking uh, about human beings, about the various implications in the world. And now after Nietzsche, after Darwin, um, it really came to this post-human paradigm shift. More and more people find evolutionary thinking as more plausible, um, feel the need to reconceptualize ourselves as non-dualist, non-essentialist entities. 
And as a consequence, that has enormous amount of, of implications for the life world when it comes in particular to issues concerning concerning ethical question, also anthropological question, also questions concerning aesthetics and and philosophy of art. And and sort of with my with the with the on transhumanism book, it was my goal that, which is really meant as a primer to the subject. Um, I, I was just trying to highlight the great variety of challenges um, with which with which transhumanism is correlated, and and to show sort of what type of challenges associated with it. And actually, in a forthcoming book um, on which I'm which is already written, which is coming out later in in November. Um, maybe, well, September, October, November with Bristol University Press, that's called We've Always Been Cyborgs. There I will engage with, in, in much more detail, sort of with transhumanist ethics, in particular with transhumanist ethics, and in particular sort of more with digitalization, as well as gene technologies, and together with a new type of ethics. Um, so there I'll deal in much more detail than in, in, in the book on transhumanism. And transhumanism is really meant to introduce the various challenges and to show that transhumanism is something which ought to be taken seriously by philosophers, by people in academia, in university, and, um, and, and confronts everyone with basically the challenges with which all of us are confronted with. And we all don't have the right answer. We all don't know exactly how to deal with the challenges of digitalization, for example. And for example, the, the, in particular, the issue concerning privacy is, I think, one of the most central issues when it comes to digitalization. And, and there is a lot of value, for example, just in collecting data, but that has enormous amount of, 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 of problematic implications as well. So there, that's simply a lot to think about and um, even though there's often quite a hostility, quite an aggressiveness in the debates, in particular concerning, th concerning people who think differently, um, I think it's important just to have a non-dualist ways of thinking and acting also means being open to the other's opinion, not like taking a, like taking a distant stance to one's own approach, to one's own prejudices and being more open to entering in the dialogue. And I'm happy that we can here realize such an open dialogue in which we get confronted um, with the various challenges with which transhumanism is concerned with. So I'm now very much looking to the exchanges on transhumanism and all these, all, all the challenges, the great variety of challenges with which we are confronted today and of which all of us are at least uncertain about what sort of what the what the final outcomes will be so um yes i'm passing on the words to me hi our moderator hello everyone um, i hope you are all doing very well today i will be the moderator for this uh, morning stream and uh, we will go to our first speaker this is Elise Bohan. Starting uh, this September, she will be affiliated with uh, the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford. Elise. Hello, everyone. It's terrific to be here from Sydney, Australia. I'm very excited to hear the number of times that the word debate got mentioned in those two introductions. Um, I think that it is a really great attitude to have towards the transhumanist scholarly community. And I could not agree with Stefan more um, about the broad significance of transhumanist issues in society. And I think people, more and more people are starting to wake up to that fact um, and to look to this community for, uh, for new scholarship that helps us grapple with all the things going on in the world right now. Um, so I think this is a terrific event. I'm excited to be here. Briefly, for those of you who don't know me, I am a historian of transhumanism. I wrote the first book length history of the subject during my PhD candidature at the Big History Institute in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I also have a trade book coming out soon called Future Superhuman, Promise and Peril in a Transhuman Era, which I'm very excited to hopefully share with some of you soon. Now, as Stefan knows, I have also written an unpublished paper exploring some issues in the Nietzsche and transhumanism debates called Nietzsche and Transhumanism, 
much ado about nothing. And I, I want to start by saying that this is a paper that argues quite strongly against many of the claims that Stefan has made about Nietzsche and transhumanism. And in light of that, I really want to thank him for having me here as a guest today to have a spirited debate about these issues. I truly believe that this is the way that the scholarly community advances, not by tribalism or ostracization, but by open and rigorous dialogue in the hope of moving towards a tighter consensus on some of the key issues over time. So with that as fair warning, I'm about to jump into some counter arguments with a view to suggesting some areas where I think that the narrative about Nietzsche and transhumanism could perhaps be tightened or strengthened. And I'll begin with the very first line of chapter four of On Transhumanism, which reads as follows. When examining transhumanism in depth, the similarity between transhumanist principles and those of Nietzsche's philosophy immediately becomes apparent the similarities immediately become apparent. Now, given the prolific debates on this subject and the dozens of papers and book chapters that have been dedicated to arguing over it, as well as the fact that one of the leading transhumanist thinkers, Nick Bostrom, disagrees with it, this seems to me to be a very bold claim. And it's a claim, I think, which requires an extensive body of evidence to stand uncontested. So what I'm going to do today is to argue that in fact, that claim is not as convincing as it might seem. And I think I'm uniquely well positioned to do so as I've spent the past decade, particularly the latter half of it, researching the prehistory, history, and modern evolution of transhumanism in depth. Now, being the massive nerd that I am, I've also read most of Nietzsche's major works because like many nerds, I think he's a wonderful writer and I enjoy his work tremendously. But in spite of my knowledge of both of those subjects, I found that the connections between Nietzsche and Nietzschean philosophy and modern philosophies of transhumanism are very far from immediately apparent to me, which is an interesting uh, point of difference. So Stefan's arguments for the connection between Nietzschean philosophy and transhumanism appear to rest principally on the claim that there are similarities between the transhumanist concept of the post-human and the Nietzschean concept of the ubermensch or the overhuman. Now, the gist of what transhumanists usually mean by posthuman, as numerous as the possible incarnations of posthuman states could be, is something so vastly enhanced by science and technology that its capabilities profoundly outstrip anything that we would recognize as normatively human. But here's where it starts to get rather complicated when we try to bring in the overhuman and trace similarities. Nietzsche was, I think, the Bob Dylan of his day, by which I mean he was a brilliant, acerbic, poetic, and um, I'm afraid changeable as the blowing of the wind. He was a fan of Wagner one day and he can't stand him the next. He's whimsical, he's at times deliberately obscure, and many of his assertions seemingly by design defy fixed or singular interpretations. Or as the Nietzsche scholar Kristen Brown, I think aptly put it, among the tales that Nietzsche tells, he seems to offer none as his official story, which makes it very, very hard to pinpoint what he actually believed or what he stood for throughout the canon of his major works. So what does this mean for the overhuman parallels? Well, my first objection is that nobody can seem to agree what Nietzsche intended the overhuman to signify. There is no consistent thesis in which Nietzsche explicitly lays it out, nor are there any direct references in Thus Spake Zarathustra or elsewhere 
to any technological methods of human enhancement, which you might expect a proto-transhumanist thinker to celebrate or identify as possible means of reaching an ubermentioned state. I do think it's notable that Professor Sogner doesn't explicitly define the overhuman using direct quotes from Nietzsche himself in this primer book. A portrait of a kind is given, which we are assured is congruent with FMS Fandery's view of the posthuman. But I think we're told that those similarities exist more than we're shown that they do. And I'm yet to be convinced by any compelling evidence that those similarities are strong. If the connections between Nietzschean and transhumanist thought are strong enough to be, as Stefan claims, immediately apparent, then surely Nietzsche's words would stand alone as the best and most efficient testament to that. But in this narrative, our problems are just beginning because Thus Spake Zarathustra is also not written in Nietzsche's voice. Like the philosophers Keith Ansel Pearson and Michael Hauskeller, I think there is a considerable possibility that the overhuman concept in this text is actually intended to be taken ironically. Far from a proto-transhumanistic goal, the overhuman may indeed be a comic concept in a parable of human fallibility designed to highlight our inability to outthink our penchant to thinking in terms of systems or quasi-religious impulses. Now, I'm not saying that I subscribe to that reading. I think anyone claiming that they can read Nietzsche with any degree of certainty and, and know what he believed is, is barking up the wrong tree. But I do think that that is a plausible interpretation. Thus, Beg Zarathustra is full of riddle, aphorism, and most conspicuously, self-contradiction of the kind that frequently undermines the speaker Zarathustra's proselytizing. In the same breath that our speaker declares that he wants to be free of herds and herdsmen and corpses, he begins germinating the seed of his own ideology, which will turn his followers into the very thing he claims to abhor, a bleating flock of herd animals. Far from an image of transcendence, this might just as readily be conceived as a warning about human hubris and the hopeless of ever escaping the programmatic errors of our eight brains. But what then of the other pillars on which the argument for a connection between these ideologies rests? Well, we have the claim that both transhumanists and Nietzsche believe that nature and values are subject to constant change. Now, I won't spend long on this point because I think it can be dealt with quickly. We ask following. Can you have an evolutionary view of life without being a transhumanist? The answer is clearly yes. You can think that Darwin was broadly correct about where we came from, not by the way that Nietzsche actually did think that Darwin was right in the specifics of evolution, uh, while modern transhumanists basically universally believe that to be the case. But you can think that Darwinism is correct while also believing that it behooves us to be extremely conservative about human progress, enhancement, and the development of future technologies. Most scientists in the developed world or in the Western world have a neo-Darwinian view of the origins of evolution and uh, the origins and evolution of life. But most scientists in the West are not transhumanists. Now, to move on to some other facets of the argument, on page 68, it is acknowledged that Nietzsche does not refer to technological possibilities for enhancement. Bostrom is right about this, but Nietzsche does not exclude such methods either. Now, as far as I know, Queen Elizabeth I never excluded such methods of human enhancement in her worldview. Nor did Mahatma Gandhi, Kaiser Wilhelm II, Julius Caesar, Mozart, or Betty Davis. It doesn't follow that they probably be, have been supportive 
of the project of radical technological augmentation of humanity if only they'd known about transhumanism or if only they'd known about genetic engineering. We find a similar claim made on page 64 where it said that Nietzsche also emphasizes that the natural sciences will be of central relevance in future centuries. This development is in the interest of his philosophical program. On these grounds, it cannot be ruled out that Nietzsche would have been in favor of implementing genetic engineering measures, even if he emphasizes the role of education in the evolutionary development of the overhuman. It cannot be ruled out ruled in. Of course we can't know whether long dead humans might have approved of things that they'd never heard of, if only they could be revived to see them. But that doesn't in any way support the claim that Nietzsche's thoughts, while he was alive, pointed in any obviously transhumanistic direction. Such a supposition, I think, is weakened even further by the many proto-transhumanist thinkers who lived before nature or who were in fact his contemporaries and who thought far more explicitly anticipated key transhumanist themes from radical life extension to radical intelligence enhancement, the amelioration of all known diseases and the development even of artificial general intelligence or automata that betrayed those characteristics. Now, thinkers of this ilk in history include René Descartes, Francis Bacon, Julian Afray de Lamotri, the Marquis de Condorcet, T. H. Huxley, and Benjamin Franklin. No such parallels of equal weight to those found in those other proto-transhumanists can be detected in the works of Nietzsche. Nor is any evidence after many, many rounds of scholarly debate and publication and journal articles, nor is any evidence as that I've seen in any of these papers been proffered to suggest that those parallels can indeed be found and that they're strong. The lack of obvious proto-transhumanist sensibilities in Nietzsche's writings really stands out for me when I go back and read one of the foundational definitions of transhumanism from the transhumanist FAQ. In that document, transhumanism is defined as the intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally improving the human condition through applied reason, especially by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging and to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capabilities. Nietzsche does not refer to or champion any technological possibilities for human enhancement. The fact that he didn't do it and might have had he lived into the 21st century doesn't set him up as an antecedent thinker in the canon of Western philosophical inquiry. And I'm afraid the championing of the use of science and technology really is a non-negotiable characteristic of a transhumanist worldview. It's in fact the principal characteristic that actually distinguishes it from humanist thought. Take that feature away and you are simply left with one version or another of humanism. So now I'm going to take these final moments as an opportunity to encourage current and future scholars of transhumanism to cast your net a little bit wider when thinking about the prehistory of transhumanism, where I think there's a great deal of really exciting work to be done. There are so many incredible thinkers out there who had mind-bendingly prescient ideas about where humanity was heading way before anything like modern, the, modern, the modern philosophy of transhumanism emerged in the 1990s. I'd really urge you to check out the works of the Russian cosmists. I fear there are many incredible Russian texts that have never been translated into other languages and have been entirely overlooked by transhumanists in the West. Other great thinkers include J.D. Bernal, J.B.S. Haldane, H.D. Wells, Julian Afray de Lamotri, 
and many, many more that are just too many to list here. Um, but if you're keen to track some of that down, you'll find lots of helpful references in my PhD thesis, uh, which is up on ResearchGate and free to read if anybody's keen to check that out. So much work, good work has been done to date and so many great starts have been made. The Nietzsche and transhumanist debates, I think, had to happen. Nietzsche would not be Nietzsche if he weren't inviting and inspiring controversy centuries down the line. But I'd love to see more detailed work across the historical gamut of proto-transhumanist thinking in the future. So take that call to action. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here and I'm very excited to read and discuss the many fascinating works of scholarship that I'm sure will follow. Thank you very much. So, great. Um, yeah, many thanks for that. Uh, these wonderful reflections and, and, and ideas. And let me directly get to some of the suggestions you're making. So you rightly point out that um, just being an evolutionary thinker is not sufficient for being a transhumanist. Um, and, but firstly, it is true. So it, it's already an important step that Nietzsche is an evolutionary thinker and he takes evolution seriously. He is one of the few, he's been reading Nietzsche, uh, Darwin. He's been engaging with Darwinism in his unpublished writings. And he even tried to develop uh, his own take of evolutionary thinking but this is all in his unpublished writing, um, in his notebooks, which were only published after his after his death. And there, so he clearly tries to show, develop his own version of evolutionary thinking. And therein, he also he also develops further um, his own account um, of of how to bring about the overhuman, how to bring about the overmatch. And this uh, evolutionary thinking by the way, already comes out clearly in, in Suspoke Zarathustra when he just mentioned that humans are a bridge between animals and the overhuman. This already shows that sort of this dynamic uh, philosophy which he, which he embraces. And that, that, is, that is a clear break away from the traditional uh, dualist humanist tradition which has been dominant in the philosophical, in the cultural spheres, dualist um, history, humanist history in, in which we've all grown up in. So now the question is, um, what, what, what's the relationship between technology and, and Nietzsche? And how far could we say something more about the affirmation of the use of technology in order to bring about the post-human, um, or at least increase the likelihood of bringing about the post-human? And that is sort of the decisive figure in how far he, he could be seen as an ancestor to, to transhumanism. And here, one needs to take into account that he employs a non-dualist way of thinking. This is getting rid of these binary du dualities, you know, material, immaterial realms, and so on. This is this is, is fundamental uh, engagement, is fundamental interest. And and he clearly stresses again in his unpublished notebooks, but sort of how to educate the overman, how to. So he even talks about breeding the overman. He talks about. And it's part of the educative process. And here it's important to realize, well, education as a technique, bringing about, bringing about uh, body techniques is just the same as a technology. Technique and technology or body techniques and external technologies in a non-dualist reign, in a, in a non-dualist um, uh, frame of mind, there is no categorical separation. So here we see by, by his way of developing a new anthropology, it's, it's our capacity of speaking, our capacity of using reason, doesn't come from a divine spark from outside, doesn't like God gives us, attaches a divine spark uh, and, and free will and, and, and so on, uh, the God's image to the fertilized egg, when egg and sperm cell come together, when, they, when fertilization gets placed, and this is how we get reason. But according to Nietzsche, according to this way of thinking, it's, 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 it's a body technique which gets realized by means of education. So parents upgrade us with language. And that's how, when we become homo sapiens sapiens. That's when we become human beings. 
And so here we see uh, learning a language is our first upgrade. And then we get further upgraded as part of the education process. We learn mathematics, we learn history, we learn physics, and so on. And, and, and so here, the boundaries, it becomes clear between sort of what is used to be seen as external and internal. There's no categorical separation. So body technique and external technologies are two sides of the same process. And, and that also applies to digitalization and gene technologies. If they are in tune with what we've always been doing as humans. We've we've permanently upgraded us in order to, in order to, you know, increase the likelihood of us living living good lives. And this is sort of what you said as a central aspect of transhumanism is a practical use of reason. He does affirm the use of reason, but not the use of reason in the sense of as in the sense of reason as a divine as a divine gift, but reason as something which has come about. Reason, he stresses, it's a small part of the body. It, it was developed as part of the evolutionary parts of the body. But because it developed, and therefore it's clear, it, it's it, it, it was developed evolutionary. But why? Because it's useful for us. It helps us survive. It helps us to become powerful. And, and, and that's why he also draws upon the use of reason, but not in order to gain eternal insights, but in order to to affirm very dominant desire, our desires, our wishes, our longings. And so that's why I think it, it is clear by his ways of talking about breeding the overhuman, you know, educating the overhuman. This is just in, in exactly in tune with, with the transhumanist goals, because there is there is no, there is no um, there is or there is a structural analogy between educating and genetic modifications. And I think that's important to realize to clearly render Nietzsche as an ancestor um, to, to, uh, of transhumanist thinking, why there is sort of that structural analogy. If we owned that, though, we would have to include thinkers like Matthew Arnold and almost sort of any melioristic humanist from the 19th century who was just championing ed education and cultural improvement as a means of in improving the future of humanity. So you would include thinkers like Julian Huxley and H.G. Wells, but a lot of secular humanists at that time who who were essentially humanists, they in some degrees may have had some some aspects of presaging transhumanism in the case of Wells and Huxley. Um, but people like Matthew Arnold, I don't think you could plausibly claim that at all. And yet he was, if we, if we take the structural analogy as being a, a, a sufficient condition for, for, for proto-transhumanist thinking, then in, any educator who is a secular humanist uh, then therefore becomes aligned with transhumanism. And I think that's too low a bar. There are not so many secular <laughs> humanists around and they, who've really had an impact in the philosophical thinking. And I agree with you. I mean, yes, Basically, once you affirm uh, evolutionary thinking as a secular humanist and you affirm the use of technologies, this this is sort of the proper ancestral way of thinking towards transhumanism. And um, and you mentioned Julian Huxley. Don't I mean he was the one who first coined the term transhumanism in in his article from 1951. Um, and not only, it was later on included in, in the book, New Bottles for New Wine, in the bo uh, book which came out in 1957. But obviously, it, he already published as an, as an article in 1951 after having given two presentation. And and it actually occurred you now as a direct exchange with um, with his friend Thierry de Chardin, this Catholic evolutionist thinker who actually talks about transhumanizing himself. And so... Um, yet, I would definitely, I mean, Julian Huxley is a clear, sort of, for me, the founder of transhumanism. He is the one who first coined the term, he embraced secular humanist thinking, evolutionary thinking, and, and he affirmed the use of technologies. I mean, he was the director of the British, British Eugenic Society. So um, wouldn't that make him, him clearly the founder of transhumanism? Uh, I think we can quibble over the semantics of founder um, because it depends where, what you want to slice as proto-transhumanist and what you want to slice as modern transhumanist. Uh, but I don't think that, that matters so much. I think Julian Huxley is unequivocally a strong proto-transhumanist thinker. Yes. I think there was a question. 
from Andre Nutas? Who you oh, so there is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, do I think that we could consider alchemists as part of the proto-transhumanist? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, but again, it depends on uh, what you know, how you are historicizing transhumanism and what uh, criteria you want to attach to the epithet of proto-transhumanism. And obviously different scholars are going to have different notions about uh, what is a sufficient condition there. So I think in a very broad sense, saying that a tradition of alchemy and the, the sort of aspiration of transmutation transmuting you know, physical bodies and the sort of immortalist aspect of, of alchemy. Um, it has resonances, certainly, in the aspiration. And I think that is a, is a really interesting sort of line of inquiry to follow. I would actually love somebody to, to trace some of the history of that thought. I think that would be really, really interesting. Um, but I do, I personally do err on the side of thinking that the strongest line of antecedent thought does begin with the scientific revolution. It's not the only antecedent line. And I think as Stefan was really getting at earlier, um, it almost it is an infinite regress back to the dawn of humanity and to the nature of humanity. If we think of ourselves as homo faber or something analogous to that, you know, every use of a tool, every use of language is an augmentation of, of our abilities and our uh, power over nature and the natural world. So in a sense, a, um, an urge towards transhumanism is, is baked into what we are. Um, but yeah, I think it actually does behoove us to talk about modern transhumanism as something somewhat distinct in its power um, and as something that is more intimately connected to the technologies of the information age. So who would you use rather critical of regarding Julian Huxley as the founder of transhumanism, even though he coined the term, who would you rather identify as sort of the decisive ancestral, like founder of transhumanism as a, as a cultural movement? Ah, uh, so like I said, I think it's uh, there's, it's the term founder that's sort of, uh, I'm quibbling over in my head. Um, I, I think Julian Huxley is a very strong antecedent thinker. But I also think, by and large, he certainly did advocate uh, various uh, eugenic uh, things. Um, and I think JBS Haldane along with him. Um, but it was a, it was in a very humanistic vein. I think their um, belief in what technology would enable was much more conservative than what a modern transhumanist belief about that would be. I think they, they certainly looked ahead and believed that we would have more powers to come, particularly in the biological front. They thought, you know, these incredible powers would be unlocked. We would understand the gene much more. Um, but yeah, in terms of being a founder, the reason I would not classify Julian Huxley as a founder of transhumanism, I do err on the side of Max Moore and Natasha V. Tamal there, which is that he did not establish anything that was um, a clear movement with clearly stated philosophical aims that actually broke with humanism and that added something very distinctive that mobilized people sort of waving that flag and using that epithet. And I think it, the first movements that began really did start in 1990 with extropianism. Okay. All right. Thank you for that uh, very stimulating discussion. Um, now, it uh, is time for our second speaker today. Please allow me to introduce Sven Nihon from the University of Utrecht. Sven, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Mihao. I hope that everyone can hear me okay. Uh, so in philosophy, we have this uh, funny and somewhat strange uh, habit of paying tribute to each other's work by criticizing it. Uh, and so it's great to be here to uh, pay tribute to Stefan and his uh, work today by uh, being one of the many who will criticize it uh, in a constructive way and uh, having this nice discussion. I mean, I'm reminded of a uh, event that uh, uh, Ronald Dworkin, uh, the great late Ronald Dworkin, uh, was involved with uh, shortly before he died, where a wide range of philosophers and academics had gathered to sort of criticize a book that he was just about to publish then. And Dworkin actually said that that's his idea of heaven, 
So, uh, I mean, I hope that Stefan will be around for a long time, but I also hope that uh, this sort of thing is uh, part of his idea of heaven, so to speak, that he enjoys uh, our critically engaging with uh, his work today. Uh, and um, Stefan himself, uh, I think earlier already mentioned that uh, transhumanism is a, really covers a wide range. Uh, and certainly Stefan's book, uh, uh, you know, we have everything from meta ethics to more normative ethics, applied ethics, uh, metaphysics, ontology, and uh, in my uh, re remarks today, I'm going to be commenting on uh, you know, different levels of Stefan's discussion, uh, both on the meta-ethical level, the normative, and the applied ethics levels. Uh, so one of the ways in which he introduces, Stefan introduces the idea of transhumanism and the debate about it in his book is that he talks about uh, a headline from an article where uh, Francis Fukuyama and others was criti were criticizing transhumanism as the world's uh, most dangerous idea, the most dangerous idea in the world. And so one of the questions one can ask about a book such as Stefan and that he himself, of course, discusses in the book is whether uh, what he's presenting is a dangerous idea, perhaps the most dangerous idea in the world. And uh, I must say that uh, when I was reading uh, this book, and I had, of course, read some of Stefan's uh, previous work, uh, I was stuck, struck by how actually it's a fairly, I would, I mean, he, Stefan himself calls it a weak form of transhumanism. Uh, I guess uh, maybe, I, I mean, weak can be misleading. It might sound like it's you know not very strong, not very well argued for, but uh, what he means is that it's a, uh, uh, what I maybe would call a mild version of transhumanism, a non-extreme version. So Stefan would say things such as, uh, and I'm quoting now, I, I, be I believe that uh, constant self-overcoming is essential to promoting my own quality of life. Okay, fine. Uh, that's, of course, something that maybe a Buddhist or something like that would also be able to say. So Stefan continues, I also consider scientific research, especially in biotechnology, extremely important, and I advocate for greater sponsorship of these research fields. I, uh, continue my quote of Stefan here, I consider the availability of anesthetics, vaccinations, and antibiotics important achievements. I hope that future achievements will also address important challenges. Uh, and I think that this stance can be parsed as a weak form of transhumanism. I mean, as I said, I, I, throughout the book, I was almost struck by how if this is transhumanism, then I think a lot of us are transhumanists, whether or not we would, uh, you know, use that term about ourselves. Because, uh, you know, if we are to some extent optimistic about technology and we believe in science's ability to improve our lives, then uh, one of the things I was struck by was that then, it, as I said, it seems like a lot of us are transhumanists. Uh, I mean, Stefan might be happy with that because maybe he wants us all to be transhumanists. But I wonder, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, uh, whether it would be interesting to see maybe even the new book that Stefan is uh, going to publish sometime soon, which I'm very much looking forward to. He will be a little bit more extreme. Uh, speaking of extreme transhumanism, uh, one of the interesting things that Stefan uh, rejects uh, an idea from uh, Ingmar Persson and Julian Savulescu. Uh, they argue for the need for what they call uh, moral enhancement. And so their argument is that uh, we as human beings, uh, and very much in line with what Stefan is arguing, we have an evolved psychology, uh, we're part of uh, evolution, and a lot of our human psychology developed during a long period of time where we didn't live in the modern world, uh, rather we lived in small uh, hunter-gatherer societies uh, where everyone knew each other, and we didn't have any advanced technologies, uh, and so uh, suddenly uh, we have a kind of really uh, quick explosion in technological development and in social development. And now suddenly we live in huge societies uh, rather than small tribes where most people are strangers to us, where we have all sorts of modern technologies. But we have a psychology, they argue, that was developed for a completely different kind of uh, situation. And that, they argue, accounts for a lot of risks that we are creating for ourselves and that we are really bad and slow at responding to. For example, using up the world's resources, creating uh, climate change, uh, you know, using uh, nuclear weapons, uh, or hopefully not using them, but developing them, uh, and posing all sorts of threats. And so they argue that uh, because we're not uh, well prepared, so to speak, with our evolved psychology to deal uh, with the problems of the modern world, I mean, just 
look at how slow we are to react to climate change issues, uh, we need somehow to try to change human psychology. We need what they call moral enhancement to make us better uh, fitted, uh, be, uh, more fit to be able to respond to these challenges. Interestingly, and this uh, is part of Stefan's week or what I would call mild transhumanism, he thinks that we shouldn't engage in moral enhancement. Uh, if we did, we would probably have to force a lot of people to uh, accept the moral enhancements. That, as uh, Stefan says, would be paternalistic, coercive, totalitarian, uh, and uh, it reminds him, uh, Stefan, of the you know the ideas in the Third Reich and, and other things that we for sure should avoid. And so Stefan says that it's much more relevant to focus on uh, uh, voluntary enhancement so that we can enhance uh, ourselves in the ways that we want to and avoid enhancing ourselves uh, in ways that we do not uh, voluntarily wish to do. I wonder, so, so Stefan's, uh, you know, he's rejecting the moral enhancement that uh, persons of Lesko argue for because he thinks that it's uh, too, uh, uh, it's not sufficiently voluntary for most people that most likely because the, the people who most need moral enhancement would probably say that we, we don't want it. Uh, and so he rejects, uh, Stefan rejects the conclusion that we need moral enhancement, but he doesn't address uh, uh, in his book, as far as I could tell, the argument leading up to that. I mean, he mentions that they argue that we need moral enhancement because of these uh, existential risks, uh, but he do, uh, he only addresses, Stefan only addresses the conclusion and, uh, and gives an argument against that, but he doesn't say anything about uh, the existential risks. Uh, and I would like to uh, uh, maybe invite Stefan to comment on that also when, we, when he comes back and, and uh, we have a discussion. So are you not worried, Stefan? about the existential risks that uh, Sablesko and Persson talk about, and especially since you also, Stefan, take an evolutionary perspective on human beings, do you think that we are sort of uh, prepared to deal with the modern world? I mean, I myself discussed similar argument in my uh, 2020 book, Humans and Robots. I was arguing uh, along similar lines that, you know, suddenly we find ourselves in a world with robots and AI, uh, but we're responding to them with human minds that developed over a long, a period of time, uh, and we may not be uh, ready to, to respond to them in a good sort of way. So that's uh, a, one thing I'm interested in discussing with Stefan, whether he thinks that our hum evolved psychology really is ready for the modern world. Now, we had a wonderful presentation by Elise just a moment ago about uh, Nietzsche, and I had prepared to just make a quick comment to about uh, the, the Nietzsche transhumanism uh, comparison. I'll just make a very brief comment about it. I mean, uh, it was discussed in much greater detail in the first uh, uh, presentation. So uh, Stefan says, uh, among other things, that uh, um, um, there's a difference between transhumanism and posthumanism. Posthumanism is much more in the continental tradition, whereas transhumanism, uh, which is what uh, Stefan is focusing on, is in the sort of the Anglophone uh, English uh, tradition where, uh, in, uh, which is, associated with uh, Darwinian evolutionary theory, but also utilitarianism and the philosophy of uh, Bentham and Mill. And, uh, and yet, uh, Stefan says that uh, Nietzsche can be seen as a kind of proto-transhumanist. And so I was just curious about, especially the comparison between uh, the um, sort of utilitarianism part of transhumanism and the, uh, and the Nietzsche, because, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it not the case that Nietzsche is quite the opponent of uh, uh, utilitarianism, that he is not uh, exactly a fan of it. And so that seemed to be another clash uh, that would be worth uh, discussing. Uh, okay, so uh, turning now from uh, that issue to the issue of metaethics, as I said, Stefan uh, covers a lot of ground uh, in his uh, uh, book. And uh, he offers what I would call a kind of sort of a relativist uh, I think he's using the uh, uh, expression perspectivalist uh, metaethics on a few occasions. He says things such as, and I'm quoting now again, uh, values are apt to change on cultural, social, and personal levels. There are no absolute and unchanging values uh, since uh, Nietzsche, and I assume Stefan along with him, rejects the existence of a platonic, uh, a, pl a platonic world of ideas that would be necessary as a foundation for any permanent values. Because there isn't this platonic realm, there are no eternal values. And so therefore we have to think that values are constantly changing and non-objective. And I 
was wondering whether maybe there's a kind of false dichotomy here, because I mean, surely there's a wider range of meta-ethical views we could take. Uh, there are many who reject Platonism about value, uh, but who don't go for the sort of the, the relativist uh, type of Nietzschean perspective that uh, Stefan is arguing in favor of. I mean, before we started the event, we were talking about our uh, mutual friend, Annette uh, Bryson, uh, uh, who I, together with whom I studied metaethics in uh, Michigan, uh, where we had people like Alan Gibbard and Peter Railton, uh, who are, uh, Alan Gibbard is an expressivist, Peter Railton is a naturalist, uh, more realist. They were both all, uh, bo both also sort of re reject uh, pl platonic realism, but they wouldn't think that uh, we have to go to sort a sort of a relativism for that reason. There's a wider range, I think, of views. I mean, just think also of people like Thomas Nagel, Derek Parfit, uh, Tim Scanlon. Uh, they're all joining Stefan in rejecting Platonism, but they are uh, sort of not driven to the sort of uh, seemingly sort of relativistic view of values that Stefan is uh, arguing in favor of. Uh, I mean, similar remarks, I think, apply to what Stefan talks about when he talks about the good. So Stefan says, for example, that he thinks that any, what he calls non-formal uh, definition of the good, uh, it's bound to fail because uh, there, um, there's so much difference in what Stefan calls uh, physio-psychological requirements uh, that uh, it's uh, unlikely that we would find a universally valid description of the good life. Uh, th that's a quote again from Stefan. And here too, I wonder why, um, you know, does this mean that we can't find universal agreement and therefore we should reject the idea that one can have sort of substantive ideas of the good life? Um, or is this a kind of false dichotomy? Because you, you could say at, at, at one hand, yes, not everyone is going to agree about what's good and what's good for them and people can disagree about this. But uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we couldn't have more substantive ideas about this and that maybe transhumanism typically does, uh, especially in the uh, work of someone like Nick Bostrom, does typically involve uh, more substantive ideas of the good. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to now skip ahead to the last bit of my remarks and that's going to continue on the theme of Bostrom, who I just mentioned. And I want to make two remarks about uh, Bostrom and how he figures in this book. Uh, the first is kind of a minor quibble about, uh, I mean, if there if there is such a thing as Bostrom exegesis, this is going to be an example of it. So Stefan talks about Bostrom's views of values, and he says that it's similar in a certain respect to Nietzsche's view. Uh, and there were some quotes where I actually thought that what Bostrom is saying doesn't necessarily sound very Nietzschean. So here uh, are two quotes where Stefan says that Bostrom is talking about value change over time. Uh, so in one quote, uh, uh, Bostrom says, transhumanism is a dynamic philosophy intended to evolve as new information becomes available and challenges emerge. One transhumanist value is to cultivate a questioning attitude and a willingness to revise one's beliefs and assumptions. That's one quote. In another quote, Bostrom says, transhumanists insist that our received moral percepts and intuitions are not, uh, in general, sufficient to guide policy. Uh, we can thus include in our list of transhumanist values the value of promoting understanding of where we are and where we are headed. This value includes, encloses other values such as critical thinking, open-mindedness, scientific inquiry, and open discussion. Uh, so uh, Stefan reads this as a kind of endorsement of uh, the idea, uh, the Nietzschean idea that values uh, can and should change. Uh, it sounds to me, however, like uh, Bostrom is just uh, endorsing values such as uh, being open to science, uh, having an open mind, and uh, not necessarily the idea that values change. So I, I was not agreeing with uh, uh, Stefan's reading of Bostrom in that uh, uh, particular uh, set of quotes. The last thing I want to mention uh, is that another aspect of um, Stefan's uh, engagement with Bostrom is that uh, just as people talk about sort of the early Wittgenstein and the late Wittgenstein, uh, you can you can in a way talk about the early and late uh, Bostrom because a fascinating thing about Bostrom is that while a lot of his early work uh, was about transhumanism and posthumanism and very uh, favorable about technological developments, Later in his career, and more recently, uh, Bostrom has been 
uh, really changing in a way uh, his focus from uh, you know techno optimism to worries about technology. So a book like Super Intelligence from 2014. Uh, is all about uh, possible risks, uh, possible existential risks related to technology and ways in which super intelligences and artificial uh, intelligences might uh, actually pose threats uh, to us human beings. And um, others too uh, worry not about necessarily super intelligence because some people find uh, that to be unrealistic, but artificial intelligence get just getting out of control. Uh, our not being able to align artificial intelligence with human values, our not being able to fully control artificial intelligence. Uh, I was struck by the fact that that was not a part of Bostrom's uh, work that Stefan uh, was uh, interacting with. Uh, so Stefan was only talking about uh, the early Bostrom, so to speak, and I would be interested in knowing what uh, Stefan thinks about the, the later Bostrom and uh, in general, there is a lot of techno optimism, I think, in Stefan's book, uh, which is in a way nice because it's also interesting to have philosophy of technology that is not just technically technophobic and worried about it. But uh, I wonder if uh, the most dangerous idea is actually the uh, very strong techno optimism. And so maybe uh, the mild form of transhumanism that Stefan presents is not exactly the most dangerous idea in the world, but perhaps. Uh, not paying sufficient attention to technological risks, such as risks to do with AI and the control problem and the value alignment problem, maybe that is a, a more dangerous thing. So I'd be curious to hear what Stefan thinks about those kinds of later ideas from Bostrom. So thanks a lot. And uh, let's see if we can bring uh, Stefan back in. Wow, great. Yeah, you've raised a lot of points in, in, in your presentation. Uh, a lot of uh, complex points. Let me first start maybe with your comments concerning weak and and a sort of mild form of transhumanism. Um, am I actually, I'm using weak because it's part of, that's a reference to one of my teachers who was Gianni Vattimo, a postmodern philosopher. And he, call, he, he refers to his own way of thinking as pensiero debole, as weak thinking. And weak thinking is an affirmation of perspectivism, perspectivism is a view that basically all philosophical perspectives are interpretations in the end. And there is no, so the, it's eroding of the possibility of an ultimate foundation. And, 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 and that's why, um, and I, I think it's important to stress, and, and this is what I'm trying to show, that on the one hand, um, so if you embrace actually the type of naturalism and most most transhumanists are quite sympathetic to na naturalist understanding of the world. Um, you would actually have to, that, that leads to perspectivism. You ought to affirm one version of perspectivism. And perspectivism itself is, is, is actually most plausibly be, be supported by a version of naturalism. And this is, there's normally in the con current philosophical sphere, there's actually the, the, on the one hand, you find naturalists, on the other hand, sort of postmodern uh, perspectivists, and they're usually quite hostile to each other. And I, I think it's important to realize actually the one supports each other and the other the, the other leads again back to the first. And that's, that's sort of, there's often a hostility to which is, uh, other, which is not justified. So by referring to weak, I'm trying to, to show that dialectics, affirming perspectivism, naturalism, naturalism leading to perspective which also re uh, leads to a weak stance, weak stance in the sense of weak as, weakness as a strength, um, by self-relativizing your own, your own understanding, the values you propose, you have more of an openness to the other. You don't take anything you supposed as a fun foundational understanding. You listen to the other, the other person might be right, and that sort of leads to the openness to dialogue, which is, I think, um, important when one um, and any 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 rigid word, any sort of foundational version of naturalism is is self defeat is self defeating is self contradictory in the end. Um, yeah, no, I, mean, yeah. I, I very much sympathize with this approach, and I was part of just teasing you a little bit about the <laughs> the, the, the choice of words. But uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we are getting a question here. Uh, so I, Daniel, Daniel David Wood says, I'm unconvinced that Nick Bostrom has changed from techno-optimist to techno-pessimism. See his work 
uh, yeah, well, okay, so that that's that made true, but certainly in in uh, if you just look at like the um, you know a lot of the early work, I mean, it's the the, the, the thing that sort of I don't know strikes you is uh, is techno optimism, but then if you look at a lot of the current work, the thing that really strikes you is techno pessimism. But sure, I mean, uh, David, you're right that uh, there are. Uh, there are nuances and there's techno optimism in some of the new work and there's techno pessimism in some of the old work for sure absolutely um maybe a, another comment which you made concerning sort of wouldn't we all be humanist wouldn't we we all be transhumanist if this is all there is to to transhumanism and um uh, maybe it just mentioned before we go to the other comment um uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. Um, and this sort of clearly just came out. I've had a discussion with a German, a member of the German Parliament last week, um, a member of the Liberal Party, someone who should be among all the parties we have in, in, in the German Parliament most open to embracing these ideas, and and even a member of here the Liberal Party and sort of concerning what 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 I've been suggesting concerning the use of digital technologies concerning also uh, and gene technologies uh, there, was, there was such a huge gap uh, there was such a huge gap concerning what we take for granted i'm i'm so much more open to the possibilities and strongly encouraging the use of trying out proactively using crispr cas genome editing um actually also in favor of digital surveillance we need to collect data which i'm strongly focusing on in my forthcoming book i deal with a lot more with digital technologies in the book coming out in, in in september and the need to collect data and why it's not in our interest what what europe is doing concerning undermining the possibility of collecting data which i think is, is undermining uh, strongly undermining um a, a Euro european interest and so um, by by target Actually, by, by putting it like this in, in, in this book, which is originally published in 2016 in the German context, um, it is actually, I, I, it, is, it, is, it is already far too strong for what is taken for granted in the cultural field, outside, in the German-speaking public, but not only in the German-speaking public. Um, what we, what you might take for granted or are open towards too, is still seen as as quite problematic, as dangerous by in 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 the wider public. So I I think there's quite a gap between what is being discussed in academia in the applied ethical circles, and to what people, you know, uh, not being concerned with the ethics of emerging technologies, what they take for granted. And and I'm trying to open up with it, but trying to change. Also, the attitudes towards transhumanism and and making change now, showing the why it should be actually in tune with using genome editing. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I, I sort of wonder what, whether this is partly uh, some of the people who say that they're skeptical about transhumanism, just being afraid of that sort of label. I mean, because it may sound a little strange and it may have bring up connotations that they want to avoid. But if you look at a lot of the things that people support, I mean. Uh, maybe someone like you are not super far away from them, really, on, on a lot of that sort of case by case issues, uh, and uh, but they would shy away from any label such as transhumanism or anything like that. So uh, I wonder if it's to some extent a, a matter of worrying about certain labels or certain concepts, whereas actually there might be much more overlap in in, in views on, on the particular issues. That, that's well, that's very true. I, I think that's very true. That's sort of it. It just makes a difference whether you um, and that's also part of like the debates on 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 genetic enhancement. Whether you use genetic enhancement, um, then you rather who's against again enhancement and who right. uses liberal eugenics. On the other hand, these are normally the bioconservatives who are more hostile concerning the, all the so the use of words and how th something is is presented is is extremely important. Um, yeah. I think there was a question um, for well, you. Like, yeah. Yeah. So there was a comment by Hi Karim. We know each other from when we were students together. So yeah, he says that uh, uh, Bostrom is neither an optimist nor pessimist. Uh, he will argue that it will have either very positive or very negative consequences. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, um, 
Sure. I mean, I, I think I, as one should. I mean, I uh, I think one should. I mean, th this is something I also like about uh, your book, Stefan, that uh, uh, you are. Uh, I mean, I, I think you're a bit of a techno optimist, but you do also look at some other dangers. And so you mention also uh, about how in your new book you will uh, treat issues about privacy. And uh, so even though you're in favor of collecting a lot of data, I mean, you're still taking seriously privacy issues. I mean, I'm reminded of the book by Carissa Valise, of course, is very worried about privacy. And so I think it's uh, her, her book, Privacy is Power, that came out last year. So it's going to be very interesting, I think, to compare uh, your forthcoming book with hers and sort of see maybe if one can find some sort of middle path. I mean, I don't know how extreme you are in the other direction in your book. So that's going to be, I think, quite an interesting uh, couple of books to compare with each other. Um, actually, I, I, I think we need to abandon privacy because the data is so important and the, and the, and the, and the advantages with data collection and, and sort of in the end, it will have to be something we need to maybe develop a European social credit system. A to European okay, system. Well, this, this might be a more extreme idea. Right. Exactly. Something that people find to be really dangerous. So. This is exactly what I've, I'm proposing yeah. in my forthcoming book in, with Bristol University Press in, 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 in September. Um, um, but we need to embrace that because of the relevance of data, relevance for health research relevance for political for innovation for relevance for scientific research relevance for political decision making um and 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 by having the data collected by political institutions um um i i, I see it I, I it's it's not a taking away our intellectual property as data one reading of relevance of privacy is obviously related to intellectual property um it's not a way of taking away our intellectual property but it's 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 given to the government as a way of our payment for our public health insurance because it's so important such a wonderful achievement in, in order to promote the health span and and so rather than us Giving the money to the giving the data to the big tech companies, and um, which which that they are using in order to make permanently make more money, um, we should be using data in a democratic manner, manner, and 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 so it should be seen as a payment for our public health insurance. And I develop that in great detail actually in the forthcoming forthcoming publication. Yeah, certainly looking forward to that. Okay, so we. Uh... <laughs> I have another comment from David Wood. So the main change, uh, yeah, I think this maybe it's the same as we had before. Maybe so. Uh, maybe uh, in the very last minute uh, before we go to the next talk, maybe I could just quickly ask you to comment on this issue about uh, Persson Savalescu. So, like I said, yeah. you sort of reject the conclusion, and I think I follow you there. But I do worry about the argument leading up to it about the existential risks. So, what's what's your take on that, and how do you uh, relate to that idea? Uh, yeah, uh, very important. Um, so, um, um, I, I don't think we sort of what would be needed in order, what would count as proper moral enhancement, moral bio enhancement, would have to promote something like negative freedom, would have to respect for the others. I don't see any any drug, any other kind of brain computer interface would, which could promote that so far. I'm not excluding the possibility that can be realized in the future. So, we don't have a technological solution yet for properly undergoing, undergoing moral bioenhancement. And, um, and, and so um, we don't have the technology yet, one step. But, and I think we've got further reason, and that goes back to, as a reference to Steven Pinker's book, um, uh, um, uh, where he clearly shows there's a correlated behavior, a correlated development concerning technological advancement um, and, 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 and a type of moral improvement but that's not a necessary connection obviously you know many of the leading figures in the third Reich were highly educated people who were just abhorring creatures so there's not a necessary development concerning further intellectual cognitive development and um, and moral developments but there is a correlation that in general normally um and, and it, it it goes to a further rec Rec um, recognition of negative freedom, and we see that in historical context. So I think um, cognitive uh, enhancements and the further promotion by means of enhancement technologies of, of various capacities is sufficient 
for for increasing the likelihood of us not getting um, not having a, a existential extension uh, uh, not having to face the uh, or, or dealing successfully with existential risk so that is sufficient as we, and we don't have any 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 proper option for successfully dealing with moral bio enhancement either that's All a right. short answer basically <laughs> thanks a lot thanks a lot to you. All right. Um, our um, next speaker is Mariano Rodriguez from uh, the Complutense University of Madrid. Mariano, you have the floor. Mariano, uh, I think you have muted yourself, sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry. I am mm. very happy to be here today to take part in this critical analysis of Stefan Lorenz Sornek's excellent book on the occasion of its English version. Uh, I am going to talk to you about the problematic coherence of a, a Nietzschean transhumanism. The self-overcoming of the human into the hover human is in Nietzsche conditioned in its possibility by the change of the value of values. It is necessary to reverse the ascetic or nihilistic values that have led to the spiritual collapse of our world manifested as the event of God's death. It happens then that supreme values are no longer valid they are incapable of giving direction to human existence. The Nietzschean transvaluation would be a cultural experiment that seeks to make us capable of supporting and assimilating the thought, the thought of the eternal recurrence, whose master is Zarathustra. The thought is a revolution in our cultural way of living the time of life, especially in the ethical sense that it settles us in the absolute impossibility of justifying the present moment by appealing to a future result that would be decidable because it would compensate our painful efforts to free us from the present misery, but also in the impossibility of redeeming the tremendous suffering of human history. The thought of the eternal recurrence with the transvaluation required to assimilate it is the true rupture of the teleo teleological structure in which human life would necessarily have been structured for millennia. The lack of meaning or purpose of the human will have to be overcome then by the creation of new immanent values that give the present moment while it returns and while that return is wanted the value of eternity. Of course, it would be the eternity of instant repetition. The change in the value of values should not be understood as the mere subversion of the values that have hitherto dominated the West, but rather as the discovery that good and evil would be inextricably linked, intertwined in such a way that to a certain extent, good itself would depend on what we consider evil. There is no room for a human life urged of the negative aspect of suffering, but neither would it be decidable, because a life purified of suffering would mean saying goodbye to pleasure and joy. Eternal life in the usual sense of religions, heaven, is for Nietzsche simply nothingness, nonsense. In Bostrom's opinion, the values of transhumanism have to be grouped around a central value, which is the exploration of the post-human realm, however much that realm exceeds our possibilities of full comprehension. At first glance, this central value seems compatible with the Nietzschean effort to present us in his tests with a set of ethical characteristics that would, would distinguish his figure of the overhuman. But this initial impression will be discarded 
as soon as we look at the appendix to Bostrom's paper on the history on, of uh, transhumanism, entitled The Transhumanist Declaration. The fact is that number seven of this important declaration affirms that the transhumanists distinguish themselves morally by defending the well-being of all human beings, animals and robots. The entire tradition of Anglo-Saxon utilitarianism is thus brought back into line with the more general and traditional orientation of Western morality, although it does, of course, introduce interesting nuances. In the sense, which Nietzsche contested over and over again, of supposing that there is absolutely no problem of morality, because the principle that was fundamental for Schopenhauer would be indisputable, harm no one and help everyone. Morality in itself is considered absolute, valid for all times and cultures. It is, of course, altruistic morality or the morality of compassion. And furthermore, it is assumed that every rational being has knowledge of good and evil in this unique sense. The problem that will remain for the philosophers of morality, those of the past and those of today, is to rationally base the supreme value of altruism on the belief that there will be objective reasons for moral action. It is true that another value of the ethical tradition that Bostrom represents is that of being open to criticism and debate. But the principle of valuing universal well-being or the well-being of the greatest number over any other consideration is expected to be beyond dispute. The case of the prominent transhumanist David Pierce, defender of negative utilitarianism, is very useful for my argument here. This author begins his manifesto entitled The Hedonistic Imperative with a few words that we do not resist quoting for their symptomatic clarity. This manifesto outlines a strategy to eradicate suffering in all sentient life. The abolitionist project is ambitious, implausible, but technically feasible. It is defended here on ethical utilitarian grounds. Genetic engineering, engineering and nanotechnology allows Homo sapiens to discard the legacy with war of our evolutionary past. Our post-human successors will rewrite the vertebrate genome, redesign the global ecosystem, and abolish suffering throughout the living world. As we can see, the moral demand to reduce or even abolish the pain and discomfort of all sentient beings is based on the conviction that suffering would no longer be biologically necessary. Pierce insists in the following way. Why does suffering exist? The metabolic pathways of pain and malaise evolved only because they served the inclusive fitness of our genes in the ancestral environment. Their ugliness can be replaced by a new motivational system based entirely on gradients of well-being. Lifelong happiness of an intensity now physiologically uh, unimaginable can become the heritable norm of mental health. In my view, it is plausible that the very core of transhumanist moral values is formed by this imperative of negative hedonism that the co-founder of Humanity Plus explains here with perspicuous clarity. And it is easy to conclude that in his, in his manifesto, there are indeed resounding Schopenhauerian echoes. This is not an isolated case. We find very similar statements in other well-known transhumanists like Max Moore, 
even though more cautiously nuances the fact that no matter how much technology frees us from human misery, it does not mean that the transhumanists aspire to a life free from risk, danger, and struggle. This admission is truly strange when one simultaneously posits the elimination of suffering as a goal, as the major goal. This forceful declaration of war on suffering, which we could almost say constitutes transhumanism in its ethical aspect, is based on the awareness of the supposed gratuitousness of it, which would be revealed to us by technological advances that allegedly bring the possibility of designing paradise. But all this would certainly be very bad according to the spirit of uh, Nietzschean uh, thought, to the extent that it is largely characterized by its tragic pessimism or pessimism or of force. In the face of Schopenhauer and Wagner's romantic pessimism and against it, Nietzsche will promote what he calls Dionysian pessimism. Its basic negative trait would be the rebuttal of European, epi, sorry, Epicurean Christian hedonism, since it is precisely related to the romantic attitude for both of them would have arisen naturally from the same decadence, decadence in a deep or physiological sense. Nietzsche denounces the vitally and culturally catastrophic effects of not being able to withstand pain, no matter how minor. This almost, almost unbeatable argument against the fundamental or philosophical viability of a Nietzschean transhumanism, which we can call the argument of suffering, has been lucidly highlighted by Junus Tunsell's critical paper. It is clear that the, that the ethical, ethical effort for the overhuman is not at all a question of eliminating suffering, but on the contrary, of affirming it tragically, affirming it together with the joy with which it alternates, alternates in the form of amor fati, love of destiny or to destiny. Pleasure and pain are inseparable and the strength of an individual is tested in his ability to approve of even the most terrible and enigmatic aspects of existence. Because it is not possible to banish the terrible, the enigmatic, from life. It is not possible, but neither it is, the, is it desirable, not even by means of technology, we should add. Otherwise, if it were possible, and we wanted to do so, we would immediately be entering pure and hard nothingness. The Nietzschean world of the will to power, a quantitate, quantitative uh, world, demands the, demands the qualitative contrast of pleasure and pain as criteria for increasing and decreasing strength. Because without these phenomenological qualities, the will to power was, uh, would not even be conceivable. So we can conclude by affirming that the values of transhumanism, at least insofar as they are based on this deep negative hedonism, have not gone through the transvaluation that Nietzsche encourages in his work. If we look at them from a Nietzschean point of view, it should therefore be said that transhuman values still are negative and reactive values, in which an attitude of resentment against human life and its tragic substance manifests itself. To be honest, that would not be at all strange because these values of resentment, in Nietzsche's opinion at least, are the dominant values in our culture. And we have, we have already seen how, for Bostrom, transhumanist utilitarianism wants to confirm these dominant values in order to integrate technological progress into their bosom. Adopting the fundamental Nietzschean imperative of fidelity, fidelity to the sense of the earth, 
entails subverting the desire for revenge into love of destiny. That is, to eliminate resentment against life as it is with its pains and sufferings. It is a question of neutralizing the desire to always be in another place, of fleeing from this world to any place as long as it is away from the world, as Baudelaire, read by Nietzsche, famously said. And one might think that we have put technologies at the service of this profound ascetic journey of ours to always be in another place. However, Sorna will again draw our attention to important coincidences between the respective values of Nietzschean thought and transhumanism. For example, individualism and individual freedom, which in the case of, of transhumanism refer especially to the use of technologies. But at this point, the situation is complicated in an interesting way because there are transhumanists such as Bostrom who coincide with Nietzsche when they come to imagining the posthuman aspect under the model of the classic perfection of the Renaissance man, while Sorna consciously distances himself from both, in my opinion, by defending the plurality of goods and the value of negative freedom, and also of a concept of a purely formal good. Along the same lines, Sorna would be in favor of an absolute nihilism, both alethic and ethical, with which he will obviously oppose the more strictly Nietzschean uh, position of the uh, uh, overcome, of the nihilism overcome. In any case, he assumes, Sorna, a weak Nietzscheanism, which is easier to integrate into the framework uh, of a transhumanist uh, movement and in the framework uh, of a liberal and democratic society such as uh, ours. Uh, thank you very much for having listened to me. Oh, Mariano, wonderful presentation. Um, you're raising really some fundamental points concerning sort of what is the appropriate ethics associated with transhumanism and what's the range. Does, is transhuman necessarily sort of utilitarian? And I, I, I want to show and I want to stress, no, you don't have to be a utilitarian in order to be a transhumanist. And actually quite a few people, um, quite a few transhumanists have have taken different different positions, even though maybe the majority of the most visible transhumanist approaches have have do regard themselves as utilitarian. There are others who have a you know have a Buddhist ethical stance. Um, there are more who take a more experimental stance. I mean, James Hughes is clearly a, 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 a Buddhist ethicist, and um, some others take a much more experimental. And Natasha is uh, Natasha Vita Moore is much more open to like taking an experimental stance towards transhumanist uh, uh, ethics. And I myself also, again, in the forthcoming book, I, I stress no, I, I present a fictive ethics. Of, mm -hmm. of, 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 of autonomy, actually. I'm stressing, no, autonomy is actually autonomy in the sense, autonomy doesn't exist. There is no ontological notion of aut autonomy which can plausibly be justified. However, it is, a, it is an achievement that we have come to an agreement. It's a fiction. It's something which we humans have created. Um, uh, and not because it, it actually it is, is plausible that it corresponds to anything in the world, but it is something which uh, which has consequent implications which we want, where people get together and say, this is something, that's a fiction which is supposed to dominate our ethical guidelines. And that would be a different type of, of, of transhumanism than sort of the utilitarian stance, um, which which is quite dominant, which is quite widely shared, and so stressing that it's an effective autonomy is much more in tune with sort of the the, the Nietzschean stance, because in Nietzsche it's always the interest, its it values and norms have an interest basis. 
are created by by humans out of the result of some personal interest they have uh, associated with the norms and what what you mentioned concerning the suffering issue yes i i also don't i'm not i'm not in agreement fully with with, with nietzsche um but nietzsche himself recognizes the strengths after the loss of god after the abandonment of of like the christian outlook nietzsche himself recognizes um the importance of prolonging life being healthy but in a negative turn he stresses he identifies sort of these ideals with the last man and he sort of despises these ideals because he affirms the overhuman as a way of being a playfulness with respect to taking a risky risky stance towards life and i i, I think both of so in a negative term he 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 also recognizes up with the abandonment of god we've got the option of taking different reactions either the lost man or the overhuman and i see both of these responses as as possible transhumanist takes so you can either use technologies in order to playfully engage take a risky life in the sense of the overhuman or you can use the technologies in this negative utilitarian sense and prolonging life promoting promoting health ha- taking security using technology to make to to become the last man and and but both presume the option of having abandoned the traditional values my own my own take would actually be a be 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 more of a like a, a synthesis a twist of the last man and the and the overhuman in the sense of um i i i agree i don't think there you know there there's not one aspect as you rightly stressed which actually constitutes a good life for everyone but okay increased health span is something which is widely shared that's why it should be politically taken seriously as an option in that respect maybe you know one aspect of 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 the last man is actually quite plausible but on the other hand we should have the freedom to to experiment with life taking morphological freedom seriously and not to be stopped by encrusted paternalistic structures from the past of us not even have the, having the right to use technologies which are reliable and which are already present like the technology for for people to have a child with three biological parents that's a reliable technology and 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 the people who want to use it are being stopped from constitutions um to using that technology and that's what i find problematic we need to open up the possibility of experiment so it it might take would be rather a synthesis of the last and the overhuman but um but nietzsche himself as i said so he acknowledges both utilitarian both this last man approach as the overhuman approach are possible reactions um he prefers the 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 overhuman i you know i'm i'm i would take the more um, a slightly different stance but this is sort of um um i i think how 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 um sort of my response to your worries concerning the possibility of a nietzschean transhumanism i am quite quite glad to to agree with you absolutely and uh, i ha- i have been th- i i i thought uh, 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 quite often, the possibility of uh, to be a transhumanism without needing to be a uh, utilitarianism in ethical in ethical matters. Uh, it's very interesting an article uh, by Rebecca Vanford. Rebecca Vanford uh, wrote uh, uh, wrote. Uh, Nietzsche on ethical transhumanism, and Rebecca Banford really uh, gave me the possibility to imagining uh, transhumanism not uh, not utilitarian. It's very important. And uh, what I wanted uh, to to ask you is for the your your position about nihilism when you mm, wrote. Uh, in several of your books about uh, an ethic and an an ethical uh, nihilism uh, in which uh, in that point you uh, distance you are distancing 
uh, very notoriously from Nietzsche. And I wanted to, 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 to ask you if you could uh, talk, uh, talk to us uh, a little about uh, this position of yours uh, on the question of a ethic and uh, uh, ethical nihilism as a, a really active and positive change for the transhumanity. Exactly. If you don't mind. Perfect. This is exactly what I noted down. This is what I wanted to address next from uh, concerning the the, re the remarks you make. Um, yes. As you rightly stressed, so Nietzsche has the sympathy or a stressing so that the need to overcome that nihilism in some way. Um, and this has to do with his remarks concerning concerning his the sort of the ideals he's affirming, what the, the communal structures um, which he regards as beneficial for, for flourishing which in, in the Sipo your passage where he stresses, in the end, he seems to have in mind some, uh, some sort of structure, social structure, where it's the majority of people doing, doing the work in order to provide the basic necessities so that the, 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 the stronger ones have the possibility of being creative, being philosophers, and so on. It's a rather like a class, a hierarchical, very hierarchical, social structure he only provides sins but i i think this is not a social structure i would want to live in this is not something which we want and um, this is not something and here i see the sort of the tension this is where i clearly say no this is where he goes into the wrong direction this is not what we want to affirm um i, I and, and 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 this is um and so um so what we what are we left with? Why don't we want that? Because that has sort of again paternalistic implication. That is forcing others to do something which they don't want to do, um, and 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 here nihilism comes in. No nihilism. Um, what what are we left with? Um, Al Alethic nihilism is sort of the the recognition of perspectivism. Perspectivism meaning every philosophical judgment is an interpretation, whereby an interpretation means that it doesn't um, have to be true, but that it uh, that uh, uh, interpretation means that it doesn't have to be false, but that it can be false because any uh, any any necessary falsification would be self contradictory, would fall into the uh, the Cretan liars paradox. Um, so in the end, we cannot any philosophical ultimate judgment cannot it cannot plausibly be, be realized, and that is clearly something which Nietzsche also affirmed. Um, what about then the second stance, the ethical nihilism, and and the ethical nihilism um, um, corresponds to to sort of the my suggestion that there it's it impossible it's implausible it's impossible to find a plausible concept of the good life which says anything in detail concerning the content of what the good life consists in and that is quite a radical you know that is quite a has some radical implications um, basically the claim goes we are all constituted of tribes affects in, in, in affects um, uh, wishes desires and there's in the end not one element which is actually which is actually there in in any any one of us in any any human entity and and, and a, a social flourishing instead of aiming for that two class society which nietzsche seems to have in mind uh, mm -hmm. would have to be something where 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 the you know where all of us can can have the greatest possibility of unfolding our tribes unfolding living according to our psychophysiological needs as long as they don't harm anyone else any other person that's obviously the the restriction, and in that way, it's a new type of liberalism, but it's not as a fundamental understanding, um, which which is which has to be affirmed. So we need to stress and we need to clarify what constitutes harm. That's a very difficult question, but um, as a consequence of that stance, it would make sense. Like as in the UK, we had the pos someone was asking to have his healthy leg removed, and he was he was having that wish for a long time. And well, he's not, as long as he doesn't claim health benefits, social benefits, he's not harming anyone else. So if, you know, this should count as an authentic wish, which, you know, one should give the option of having him realized um, rather than claiming he's just a mad person. 
And this is one of the implications, just one example which demonstrates what sort of that ethical nihilism demands. So it's the avoidance of that hierarchical social structure which Nietzsche had in mind as a previous. Excellent, excellent and, and very interesting, really interesting. I also completely agree that a Nietzsche and transhumanism such as yours would bring benefits for both for transhumanists, giving them philosophical depth and freeing them from traditional moral commitments, and for Nietzscheans too, concretizing and therefore updating the overhuman topic. Very, very, thank you very much for inviting me to this, to this event. And uh, I, I, I am, uh, I, I must uh, leave now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Moving uh, on, allow me to introduce Manuel Knoll, Professor of Political Theory and Philosophy at the German Turkish University of Istanbul. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mihai. Thank you, Stefan, for inviting me. It's great. I'm excited to be here. I will also talk about Nietzsche and transhumanism. Let me start with a few remarks to Elisa Bohan. Uh, she seems to agree with Bostrom that Nietzsche is not a predecessor. Nietzsche is not a progenitor of Transhumanism, she says, uh, there nothing in Nietzsche's thought points in a transhumanist direction. I disagree with this view. Unfortunately, Elise is not here anymore. Otherwise, we could discuss, but maybe she will watch this. Uh, I think there can be no doubt that Nietzsche is uh, an evolutionary thinker. He says already in the uses of history, uh, for life, that there is no cardinal difference between man and animal. Um, he says uh, man is the yet undetermined animal uh, that's beyond good and evil, uh, number 62. Um, so I will, in my talk, I will first of all give some indications uh, that Nietzsche is indeed a progenitor of transhumanism. Uh, of course, I disagree partly with Stefan's interpretation. I will focus on the concept of the Übermensch, on the concept of the overhuman. And I don't think uh, that Nietzsche um, conceptualizes the overhuman as a new species. I also have uh, several uh, texts, um, so I will share my, my screen um, in a minute. Um, let me just say one more remark um, again to Elise's talk. Uh, Stefan writes in his book, Nietzsche does not exclude technological methods of enhancement. Uh, I think Nietzsche is clearly a thinker uh, who is concerned with the future of the human being and also concerned with the enhancement of the human being. I'm not so sure uh, whether he has uh, the technological uh, methods in on his mind. I mean, I just want to give one uh, a tiny argument here. Nietzsche thinks uh, we can never get rid of some form of slavery. He, he says this in the Greek state, but he repeats this at the beginning of what is noble and beyond uh, good and evil. And and so he ex seems to be excluding, you know, slavery not in the most literal Greek ancient uh, Roman sense, but he thinks we always need some slaves. He, I guess he talks about uh, fabric uh, slavery, like workers working in a fabric, you know, in the 19th century, that was uh, pretty tough, like 60, 60 uh, hours a week. Um, and already, and so he has not, he thinks we can never get rid of this. And of course, technology is a possibility to, to get rid of this. Already Aristotle said, if we had uh, kind of the robots Hephaestus, the craftsman uh, god, um, has devised, we, we wouldn't need masters, wouldn't need slaves anymore. He says this in book uh, one of his politics. Okay, that's like a little introduction. Let me share my screen and I hope uh, that will work. Share screen. Uh, I think I have to click on here. Share. Can you see this?
Could anyone give me feedback whether you can see my screen? It's uh, visible. Thank you. Okay, so I will talk about transhumanism and Nietzsche's Übermensch. Stefan argues against Nick Bostrom's view that Nietzsche is not a progenitor of humanism. I do agree uh, with this view, and I think uh, Nietzsche is not only uh, an evolutionary thinker, but a thinker who is concerned of the future and enhancement of the human being. Stefan's thesis is that, quote, Nietzsche's concept of higher humanity and the overhuman resemble Esfadiers, I don't know whether I pronounce this correctly, concepts of the trans and post human, but not Bostrop. Stefan's thesis is there are striking similarities between the concept of the post human and Nietzsche's over human. So let's get into the terminology for a moment. What are Esfandiari's definitions? Um, that's kind of Stefan's uh, summary of this position. Uh, the transhuman still belongs to the human species, but has already attained qualities that go beyond the usual concept of the human and has the potential to initiate the evolutionary step toward a new species. The new species is referred to here as the post-human. So the transhuman is still Homo sapiens, but already on its way to a new species. And the post-human is already there, is already, uh, has already achieved to be a new species. So as I said before, I agree with Stefan's central thesis that Nietzsche is a progenitor of transhumanism. Uh, and, you know, that could be a different talk. I will focus mainly on the concept of the overman. I think at the center, and it's so clear if you, if you, if you know Nietzsche's writings, that at the center of Nietzsche's thought is his concern with the future enhancements of human beings and how this can be uh, promoted. And he's, on the other hand, he fears uh, all forms of human decay. Uh, he talks about the last man. Uh, he talks about in contemporary terminology, which has which we see right now, he talks about the hypermoralist. Uh, he, he, he fears the overall degeneration of man. And he says like Christianity uh, bungled and botched uh, this beautiful stone of, of, of man. So, 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 so he is very concerned of the future of uh, the human being. Okay, so here I, I totally agree with Stefan. Now uh, my critical thesis, um, one, the distinction drawn in part four of Nietzsche's philosophical narrative, Zarathustra, between the higher humanity and the overhuman, uh, you know, the overhuman is like the posthuman, the higher humanity is only the transhuman, is not very important in Nietzsche's own thoughts. So I wouldn't put so much emphasis here as Stefan does. And I think our main disagreement in the interpretation of Nietzsche is that I think Nietzsche does not conceive of the overman, the Übermensch, as a new species, uh, though especially if you focus uh, the, the the interpretation of the overman on the Zarathustra that can easily uh, be 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 the result of the interpretation. Let's look at Nietzsche's texts. I have a couple of them, and I will. I think we should, in order to come up with uh, the, the a right interpretation here, we should we should focus on the text. I think it's so important the notion of uh, God is dead uh, in the fifth. Uh, book of the of beyond uh, of, of, of uh, um, the gay science Nietzsche says that means that people stopped believing it's more of a diagnosis people don't believe in God anymore there was Marx there was Feuerbach there was already in the 18th century Voltaire there's all this criticism of of religion and 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 Nietzsche is he he, he thinks about he doesn't really want to prove this he he wants to think about the consequences what what's going to happen uh, when, when when God is dead. Uh, what's going to happen, an interpretation of the world is collapsing, a worldview of, uh, is collapsing, a view of the human being is, is collapsing. The human being is not uh, a creature of, of God. Human reason, 
from an evolutionary perspective is not the divine element in the human being. It's just an instrument for the weaker, deficient animal man to uh, survive. So there is this clear and I think very important connection uh, between uh, that people don't believe anymore uh, in God, that the Christian worldview collapsed and the need for something to fill the lacuna, for something to fill uh, the gap. You know, the Zarathustra already starts. Zarathustra goes down from the mountain. He talks to the old Eremit and the old Eremit is still praising God. And Nietzsche says, huh, how is it possible that the old Eremit hasn't heard that God is dead? So kind of here, our first Nietzsche quote from, the, from Zarathustra, he says, dead are all gods. Now we want the overman uh, to live. So, 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 so there is a lack of meaning. There is a, and, and I think the next quote is probably the most central quote on the overman from Zarathustra. Here Nietzsche says, behold, I teach you the overman. Actually, that's uh, Zarathustra who says it, not Nietzsche. We should not identify uh, Zarathustra's teaching and Nietzsche's thought. We have to be very careful here, and I will uh, argue for this in a minute. Behold, I teach you the overman, says Zarathustra. The overman is the meaning of the earth. And I think here, that's Nietzsche talking. The overman is the meaning of the earth. We need new meaning, right? The old meaning is gone. Uh, we, we, we need a new focal point. Uh, and that's also very interesting. He keeps saying, your will say, and that keeps repeating in most of Nietzsche's statements about the overman. The overman is something that can be willed, that can be intentionally uh, promoted. Let your will say the overman shall be the meaning of the earth. I beseech you, my brothers, remain faithful to the earth and do not believe those who speak to you of extraterrestrial hopes. They are mixers of poisons, whether they know it or not. You know, we have to focus on, on this world. When we die, uh, it's over. Uh, that is uh, very clear for Nietzsche. He makes this already clear when the tightrope uh, walker uh, dies. He says, for him, uh, they have this last conversation. It's, it's over. So we need a new view of man. Also, one more thing I would like to add here. When, when God is dead, that also means uh, that not all souls are equal. Uh, in the eyes of God. This kind of thought of equality, of human equality, of equal human dignity, that thought is gone. So we have to go back, and you know, Nietzsche was a philologist, we have to go back to the ancient Greek uh, perspective that human beings are not only different, but also have different value. That's Nietzsche's view. Okay, now the overman, a new species, you know, the beginning of this of Zarathustra really seems to point in this uh, direction. Here in the third uh, bullet point, uh, you see the most uh, important quote pointing in this direction. Uh, Zarathustra talks to the people on the marketplace and he says, mankind is a rope between animal and overman, a rope over an abyss. So that seems to be okay. There's the animal, uh, there's the theory of descent, there's evolution, then there's Homo sapiens, and it seems, wow, then there must be a Homo uh, superior, there must be the overman. Uh, but I think we have to look at the context of Zarathustra's speech. Uh, Zarathustra talks to the people on the marketplace. And they are waiting for a tightrope walker, right? The tightrope walker walks from one place to the other on, on a rope. And, and that's the abyss, right? Also, the tightrope walker in, in the book, he, he will fall down and he will die. So, so, so I think uh, we cannot identify what, what Zarathustra is talking to the people on the marketplace, telling them we cannot identify this with Nietzsche's views. Um, I'm just going to the next quote, and I think uh, we should not limit our interpretation of the overman to the Übermensch to Zarathustra, because Nietzsche later, he makes some very clarifying statements. And I'm quoting these here from the Antichrist uh, 3 and 4. 
Here Nietzsche says, the problem I am posing is not what should replace humanity in the order of being. The human is an end point, but instead what type of human should be bred, should be willed as having greater value as being more deserving of life, as being more certain of a future. This more valuable type has appeared often enough already, but only as a stroke of luck, as an exception, never as wilt. And he keeps on saying, in another sense, there is a continuous series of individual successes in the most varied places on earth and from the most varied cultures. Here, a higher type does in fact present itself, a type of overman in relation to humanity in general. Successes like this, real strokes of luck, were always possible and perhaps will always be possible. And whole generations, families, or peoples can sometimes constitute this sort of bull's eye right on the mark. And the peoples who are such a lucky stroke for Nietzsche, of course, are the ancient Greeks. Um, yes, um, now I think comes a very um, significant quote, and I'm almost done uh, with my talk. Uh, that's from It's a Homo, where Nietzsche looks back, and he says here, the word overman, as a designation for a type that has the highest constitutional excellence. In contrast to modern people, to good people, to Christians and other nihilists, a word that really makes you think when it comes from the mouth of a Zarathustra, a destroyer of morals. This word overman is understood almost everywhere with complete innocence to mean values that are the opposite from the ones appearing in the figure of Zarathustra, this connection uh, we heard in Mariano Rodriguez talks that the overman goes along with the creation of new values, with the devaluation of uh, values. Um, so I keep coming back to this quote. Uh, this word overman is understood almost everywhere with complete innocence to mean values that are the opposite from the ones appearing in the figure of Zarathustra, which is to say the idealistic type of the higher sort of humanity, have saint, have genius. And now comes a very uh, important quote. He says, other scholarly cattle have suspected me of Darwinism for this reason. I think that means no, uh, these interpretations uh, that uh, the overman is a new species is not the interpretation which Nietzsche wants. And I think also in the quotes from uh, anti the Antichrist, we, we, we see him argue against this. Maybe he toyed uh, with his idea, but I don't think uh, that this is really uh, what he wants. So here's my last slide. Um, I'm proposing, and you know, I also worked on this before, I'm proposing an alternative uh, reading of Nietzsche's Overman. I think Nietzsche's whole philosophy is concerned with the enhancement of man. In the, already in uh, the Greek state, he talks about the production of the Olympic existences of the geniuses later on in the third untimely consideration here on the slide. Nietzsche formulates an anthropological imperative that is based off on his image of humanity. He says, mankind must continually work on the production of individual great men, and that and nothing else is its task. And I think that shows that clearly Nietzsche's thoughts point in a transhumanist uh, direction. And I would say this imperative is at the center of Nietzsche's whole philosophy. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Wow, you raised so many important points. I made an entire a, a long list of things I would want to respond to. And many things also, I mean, you, sort of by referring to the passage sort of um, when Nietzsche talks about breeding, that, that the old human needs to be bred. I mean, that is a clear indication also of the ancestral thinking of, of Nietzsche uh, concerning, uh, uh, concerning, concerning transhumanism. So it's clearly sort of the activeness of, of bringing about, breaking away from the boundaries of who we are currently are as, as human beings.
And many thanks also for context uh, contextualizing sort of the Zarathustra passage from animal to to over human. Yeah, th th you're right. I mean, it's it's very it's always very important when particularly when reading Zarathustra to to take the wider context in and to be proper hermeneutic and slow readers and take the hermeneutic context into into consideration. What I do in order to 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 sort of separate yourself the understanding uh, from from that in, in the overhuman as a member of a new species reading you also refer to Darwin and, and sort of to 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 Nietzsche's comments where he clearly distances himself from from sort of from Darwin that he's always been misunderstood as a, as a Darwin is and um, but I I have a different understanding actually of that passage um, because. Um, he, he, in different passages, he explained what he understands, what he identifies as Darwinism. And Darwinism is sort of the struggles for survival. But he clearly separates himself from, from it's, it's, not just, it's not just survival we need. We don't we need to survive. We, we don't want to survive just for the sake of survival. We want to survive in order to become powerful. So it is, so when he distances himself from Darwin, it is not the evolutionary aspect and the overcoming of humanity w w uh, from which he wants to distance himself, but it's it's the fundamental drive which you find in in in, in humans and in other beings as well. So it's we don't want to uh, what he wants to separate himself from. It's not we don't want just want to survive, but we want to become powerful. But, but powerful is always based upon an in interpretation of what counts as powerful. So um, yeah, this, uh, you're right. You're right. I mean, clearly, the, in the literature, Nietzsche's relation to Darwin is quite uh, disputed. Like Werner Stegmaier says yes, uh, Andreas or Sommer says no. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the point you're saying. Darwin is all about survival. It's about self-preservation. But for Nietzsche, it's about enhancement. It's about getting more powerful. And I think here, that's another argument that Nietzsche is a pregenitor of transhumanism. Exactly. That makes him even more transhumanist than sort of the, if he was merely a Darwinist in the, in the survival aspect, no? And, um, and there's another aspect, actually, you mentioned at the beginning, um, which I, I think it's, I'm, I'm extremely, I've been extremely fascinated um, from sort of when he talks that every community is, needs some kind of, is a slave caste, needs some kind of slavery. Um, and I think um, that might be taken into consideration when we talk about digitalization or robot automation nowadays. The robot is a slave. That's literal trans, the literal translation of what a robot stands for. So by robots coming about, by digitalization, by automation being promoted, um, we basically have to work less. And that's what you can see in the past. That's what, just look back in the past, uh, past 150 years, you know, beginning of the 19th century. What did we realize as part of the industrialization as a development when all the technology, you know, many of the significant technologies have been developed and, and, and automation took away removed mm, humans from a lot of uh, terrible tasks they had to undergo through. And then at the beginning of, of, of the 19th century, we, we had, um, you know, 90% globally were at the edge of starvation and 80% in England were at the edge of starvation. Now it is only 10% of the world's population, which is, 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 is sort of, is, can be associated with absolute poverty, sort of on an absolute basis, not on a relative poverty. And that's what our world in data from the University of Oxford clearly says. So, and what did we have at the beginning of the 19th century? Then we had people didn't have any spare time, vacation, you know, 30 days off, what is like the standard procedure nowadays, um, people go on vacation. We need to realize, you know, basically all of us, we are noblemen, sort of in the developed countries, at least, in many other parts of the world as well. Um, so because technology, because of automation, um, um, being what, you know, what used to be done by the slaves. So it, it is, um, so um, it is, it is also, this leads to reconceptualization of ourselves um, um, as, as human beings, 
you know, in developed countries and the ones who've, and, and, and not only these, because even in, in, in lesser developed countries, people have significantly increased their lifespan. So using technology further, promoting automation, digitalization is, is sort of externalizing what used to be done by the slaves is now being done by by uh, automatic work and and so in that way Nietzsche had a very good perception I think um, I don't know what you think about that reading and whether you agree with this suggestion I would be curious to hear well I I think I'm I'm quoting uh, Stefan Sorgner right he, Nietzsche wouldn't exclude uh, <laughs> these forms of enhancement uh, if, he, if he were aware of them. But I think he has kind of a blind spot here because I think when he need, we need every culture and we will always need some slavery. I don't think he thinks about robots. I think he, he really thinks about human slaves. And you know, he has uh, in, in, in human all to human, he talks about the anonymous fabric slavery. And, and yeah, he doesn't think of literal uh, 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 slaves, uh, slave trade, you know, the slavery got already abolished in, in, in Great Britain at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, maybe there are some um, some quotes in Nietzsche's, there are some, some passages where he talks about this, but I'm afraid he has a bit of a blind spot. I agree with you, it's a great chance to improve people's lives, uh, apart from all the dangers and risks. We heard about this, and I think we should all, never forget about those. Uh, but it's, uh, I think Nietzsche is not so aware of this perspective. Mark, I, I mean, No, I, I agree, actually. No, that's why what I said when I responded to Mariano earlier on, I said, no, he probably has in mind sort of, you know, there are the artistic philosophic creators, and there is the majority of humans supporting them as, as slaves. But that's, I, I would simply say, no, then we need to, I mean, this is not what we want. We need to, you know, move away from that Nietzschean goal. That's not something which would, which could be incorporated in our, that's at least not something which I would want. Maybe there are some, some people who still have the understanding of leaving as artists and having their own slaves, but, but I don't think it, it is, it is, that is generally shared. It is definitely not shared by me, no? And, um, and, and and you also mean yeah the the central issue and the further issue besides others is sort of the question concerning the meaning, um, the meaning giving function is the meaning of the earth, um, and how far do uh, Carl Gustav Jung stressed you know he had most of his patients were in his forties or older and they they were rich they had a few family kids whatever everything what people might normally identify with a good life. Um, but they were still, like Tolstoy as well, struggling with the question, if there's no God, if there's no afterlife, um, what is it all there for? What The question of the meaning. In, in a world without, without any transcendent metaphysical hopes, you know, is there anything which could provide us with meaning? And I think also here, this is sort of something which is not normally being tackled by transhumanists, but I guess by dealing with, engaging with Nietzsche's reflections on that issue, in particular also not only the overhuman, but also the concept of the eternal recurrence of everything, uh, um, which I, I, I think is a, actually um, an intriguing way to think about a possible imminent, non-dualist imminent understanding of what could provide humans with an with a, with a imminent form of, of, of meaning of life. Yeah, I think Nietzsche is so interesting here because, you know, in the old paradigm, you look out for the meaning, right? God hit the meaning somewhere in the world. But, you know, if you if you overcome this worldview, you have to create the meaning yourself, right? You, you It's this immense freedom to to create the meaning, to, to create uh, new values. And, and, and that's the positive perspective. You know, Nietzsche, I think it's also, you know, Zarathustra is also the teacher of the eternal recurrence, affirm life enough, see these possibilities, see these opportunities and create a beautiful meaning, but uh, uh, this worldly meaning, not another worldly meaning. Exactly. I think our time is up, Stefan. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Matt.
All right. Um, our following speaker is uh, Mirko Garasic, uh, adjunct professor in bioethics and digital ethics at uh, Lewis University in Rome. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Stefan and the organizers for this interesting and stimulating debate that, uh, as it has been said from the beginning, aims at bringing together different positions. So I'll play along and bring on the table a few more hopefully useful critiques, uh, though I do touch upon some of the points that have been raised already by other colleagues. Hopefully we will have a, a different angle nonetheless. So uh, in particular, I mean, among other things, of course, I'd like to push on, on two points, one smaller and one more substantial. So the, the first one um, inescapably refers to the pandemic we are living in. And in the book, it seems pre pretty evident that you don't support argument in favor of enforced or compulsory moral enhancement, as Sven pointed out uh, in his comment as well, and you replied to him already. Yet you mention the example uh, of compulsory vaccination in the book as a good option for not forcing behavior on others uh, and of course you you replied on this uh, already in the exchange that uh, followed the Sven presentation but given that there have been in the literature some call for uh, compulsory moral announcement uh, in the light of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, which of course has called also for attention more broadly on the announcement project namely as, as it is as it is, was mentioned already, um, are we sure that it is that liberal or is it that the moment that we are under pressure, the liberal dimension is taken away and we just need to comply with the mor morality that is established by the majority authority, depending. And uh, I was wondering, I mean, uh, first of all, if somehow the pandemic has shaken a little bit uh, your view on the matter. I gather from your answer from before uh, that uh, it might not be uh, so. Uh, and yet I felt like uh, asking you more directly even um, even if that is the case because I did on the notes. So, um, and uh, again, how do the choices of individuals need to be bound to that of society? And I think this, are questions that I, of course, I will leave to you or possibly to the audience, uh, and they are not that easy to answer even in this context necessarily. But this relationship between the individual and society is something that is very delicate. Uh, and you also uh, mentioned this uh, in a way when talking about giving up privacy, right, in, in another of the comments that were made previously. And, and this allows me to uh, uh, reach my second point that I want to raise, okay? And as I said, a little bit more substantial. Uh, now the health span and other terms that are used in the book, uh, you refer to even in the vaccine example, seem to refer to self-standing individuals. And that's something I find problematic, especially when involved evolved into lifespan extension or quasi immortality. Now you do dismiss quite quickly immortality as uh, a not so reasonable term as our solar system will eventually collapse and so forth and so on. So there is uh, no way we could convincingly expect to live that long. And yet by doing so, you also avoid affirming or not if we should try to live say for 1000 years which is you know quite an achievable uh, target at the moment and yet is way less that you uh, would need to, to reach the um, extinction of our uh, 
Sun, for example. Uh, so I wonder if this early dismissal is functional to avoid engaging with one of what is uh, one of the most prominent dreams or goals, again, for many transhumanists. And that is life extension, if not immortality. And interestingly, I found in, so in Spencer Hawkins' introduction of the English version of the book, uh, now there is reference to parabiosis and its revival in recent years by various companies such as Ambrosia, for example, uh, through the use of plasma from young adults to improve health in the elderly. And for those of you not familiar with the term, Parabiosis is a medical procedure or experimental technique in which two living organisms are joined together, almost always surgically, so that they can develop single shared physiological systems, usually a shared circulatory system. Blood exchange, which for example occurs 10 times a day in joint rats, which of course are part of the experiment, makes it so that some physiological parameters can be balanced out of between the two organisms thanks to the exchange of signal molecules. And in the past, parabiosis was used for various kinds of studies on animals, from those of, on metabolism to those on diabetes. In recent studies on parabiosis conducted with more reliable protocols by combining young mice with older ones indicate that after a certain time, the latter show more stem cells and more neurons, more active synapses, more genes evolved in memory process, and finally, fewer inflammatory process, which are believed to be among the causes of aging. It has been shown that there is no significant extrasanguineous exchange of cells from one organism to another in parabiosis, and for this reason, the cause of the observed phenomena to the benefit of the old and the detriment of the young is believed to be the plasma. So the liquid part of blood that contains only proteins and hormones, which unfortunately, again, we have heard of uh, quite a lot uh, in the last year, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, as, as a potential uh, way out um, to contrast uh, COVID-19, as we know. So, for example, it has been hypothesized that what is missing in older blood is oxidosin. And this led to experimentation with repeated transfusions of the plasma into older specimens, avoiding the complex and invasive technique of parabiosis. Okay, and as I said, and as it was mentioned also in the introduction of the book, again, there are some uh, private companies that I'm picking up on that. Uh, with also some scandals uh, uh, related to it, let alone some ethical debate. So of course, there are many issues that are raised by the possible implementation of such a technique, uh, assuming it works, and uh, life extension more broadly. Okay, it's not that uh, far away that we had this um, claim that uh, um, a net transplant was something uh, about to occur, which is another version of the uh, life extension or quasi-mortality debate. So from intergenerational to distributive justice, from exploitation to global south and global north tensions, and I've tried to address some of these issues in my writings, uh, they all have at their center the tension between the single and the community in one way or another. And, and the one aspect I would like to push you on is the relationship between these, these two entities when considering life extension and nature. Now, in the very last page of your book, you write, and I, and I believe not incidentally, uh, the preceding reflections do not represent a radical critique of the technological development of the digital world. And this process is also partly responsible for the fact that the average lifespan in Europe, North America, and, and Australia has exceeded 80 years, whereas in Nigeria, one of, of the world's poorest countries, it is about 50 years. So it seems clear that you are very aware of the huge difference in average lifespan across the globe. What I'm less clear about is what you propose to counter 
this disparity, if at all. And in doing so, what would be the priority? Ensuring a longer lifespan of human animals throughout the planet or not? Now, your positions seem very sympathetic towards non-human animals. In theory, potential beneficiaries of, of transhumanism as well. And yet, I'm not too sure on how you see the reconciliation between the life extension of human animal individuals and care uh, for the environment. Again, you don't engage with the discussion on the impact of Anthropocene, but it is worthy, I think, taking into consideration how within the posthumanist spectrum of positions in relation to the environment, there are two opposite groups. So posthumanism represents an opportunity to shake the given scheme at the base of Anthropocene by leading us to reconceptualize the human in two opposite directions. On the one side, some argue that posthumanism would imply that the specificity of human agency should dissolve into a broader, all-encompassing understanding of nature. On the other side, others suggest that our future as a species and as a planet relies on the capacity to evolve further and become posthuman, hence controlling nature even more neatly than we did before. Now, for the first group that I think you'd classify as critical posthumanists, the most logical way to defuse the threats imposed on our planet by a human-centered human supremacy is that of removing men from the center of the paradigm. The posthuman sociology of the environment proposed by Nick Fox and Pam uh, Aldred, for example, calls exactly for such a move. And for those, the idea of extending human life seems meaningless in a sense. I don't know if this is connectable or not. The discussion uh, would just started about uh, meaning, but perhaps yes. And yet, those are the ones more inclined to care about nature, including non-human animals like you. Now, on the other hand, we have transhumanists that see the embracement of any technology as a confirmation of our superiority, bound to become inferiority towards transhuman or posthuman in a sense. And in, in this case, the strive for longevity or immortality is consistent and understandable, but it becomes harder to see why we should care about non-human animals necessarily. And if you like, this could also see uh, could also be seen as an evolutionary process. And then again, in your answer to Mariano, for instance, um, you reinforce the idea that prolonging life might not be the way to go. So again, I think uh, that you know there are many uh, that there is room for some further clarification, if you like, uh, on this aspect. Uh, and in any case, I would uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on that and perhaps discuss it. So thanks again. I hope that uh, you find it interesting somehow. You really raised two absolutely fundamental issues about which we could talk for quite some time. Um, I fear if I start with the second one, we will not get to the first one. I will do so nevertheless. You said it's it's more it's 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 trickier. I think you might be right, um, but I think the first one is 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 important too. So. I, as you know, I'm I'm also engaged. You know, I'm with critical posthumanism in the and 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 the way I presented the weak transhumanism also incorporates critical posthumanist issues. And so I'm I'm extremely aware of the environmental impact and the environmental aspects which need to be considered when reflecting upon the impact of emerging technologies. The challenge is the following one: What does moving away from anthropos anthropocentrism mean? What does it have to imply? And here there's a, 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 an intense discussion going on between critical posthumanists and, and transhumanists. 
And I will actually deal with that further also in the forthcoming uh, monograph when I do stress, and I am a cream who is aging as a disease, and, and the majority of people do share an increased health span is beneficial for their lives, for their flourishing. And, is, is, um, it, and it needs to be taken into consideration on a political level. Um, so that is, that is an important aspect. Which I do share with with the majority of you know with transhumanists in general, maybe the majority, but I clearly distinguish increasing health span. Immortality is not an option, as I said, and we we shouldn't even talk about you know this is just no serious thinker should should even engage with that option of realizing an imminent form of of immortality. However, and you rightly asked me to 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 to, to comment on that. What about two hundred five hundred years? Yes, and I will definitely show. And, and also in the next book, um, you know, sh we've got sharks who live more than 200 years. We've got other animals who live then more than um, um, 500 years. And, um, and you know, if, if it was possible to, to analyze which genes are responsible for longevity, for their longevity, and we could integrate that in, in the human gene pool, that, I, I, you know, that would be in the interest of, of a lot of human beings. Um, sort of just talking about the impact now separately from from the from the environmental and so on uh, consequences so and then so yes it is something we, we we should work on we should take into consideration what about because it, it because it promotes human flourishing the flourishing of 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 persons in in general so what is now the standpoint and i, I want to stress i focus on 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 persons and not on and persons uh, includes the possibility of non-human persons non-human animals who should count as persons and i developed that in, in much more detail also forthcoming sort of who should count as non-human person where i clearly dist distinguish myself also from singer's perspective um where suffering matters and the levels of suffering um but it, it's 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 not only humans who should count as persons and making such a suggestion from the critical post-humanist side, then I get criticized. Oh, you're thinking again in the dualist manner. Mm -hmm. Persons, non-persons. But I, I would rather no. I'm not dualist. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of. It's a gradual uh, hierarchy of of levels of suffering. So it's different types of personhood to which we get to in the end. It's not a dualist understanding. And, and, and the posthumanist way out, I mean, without having any, any such understanding, does not work on a practical basis, not taking any clear stance on the moral status. In addition, and this is one of the challenges, so I think sort of having attributing, granting personhood to non-human animals is already a non-anthropocentric stance because it doesn't, it, it, it clearly says some humans should not count as persons. Furthermore, what what do some critical posthumanist claims? And here the issue of the environmental consideration also comes in. Um, wh when they present a non-anthropocentric stance, and there are some critical posthumanists, and I'm not mentioning their names because I don't I don't want them. You know I don't want this to be considered further. I find it anyway um, really problematic um, taking taking critical posthumanism so far. And they say, take the stance basically, well, um, humans producing carbon di dioxide, each human is presenting, um, is, is um, emitting more carbon dioxide emissions than, than um, and is causing harm to the environment. And so what would be in the interest of the environment? It would be to get rid of humanity altogether. And this is a stance which has been, if you take that understanding to the extreme, Non-anthropocentrism leads to the position of, you know, it would be ideal for the world if we get rid of humans altogether. And, and that's just something where I, I'm sorry, I just, this is not something which I can take seriously anymore. This is, this goes, this takes non-anthropocentrism to extreme, which, which I, it bears any relevance for the life world. It's just, you know, it is, I understand the logic, but it, this is any, any relevance for the life world, anything which could ever be taken seriously as an as an as a political enterprise, which could be shared by many people, no? Okay, but may I? Yeah. I don't know how this works. Can we interact or? Oh, or, uh, or? maybe just yeah. just to finish yeah. Yeah, that sure. thought. So, sure. so um, just to finish that thought. Um, sure. 
Now, and, and so that's why I think, so um, not taking environment into consideration is, is extremely important taking non-anthropocentric stance, but not in the sense of excluding human interest. And by including human interest, and by, I think, moving towards a personhood for non-human animals is sort of, it's not a perfect stance, it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's a contingent suggestion. It's an as good as it gets ethics, which I'm suggesting here. And, um, you, and we can see, and to balance sort of increasing lifespan and in, in the consideration, and I, um, there are very good studies by the economist who's hosting the website Our World in Data. Um, and he's, he's made very good analysis concerning increasing cognitive capacities education in the various countries. And he's seen sort of the re reproduction rate, the higher the level at, at, of education technological development is, um, the lower the reproduction rate. And according to his studies, he, he clearly shows, um, Max Rosa is his name, and he clearly shows um, that the 13th billion person will never be born. Um, if we continue with the development of capacities, technological, you know, life quality, and that's what I, I'm supposed to. Um, in that case, um, like an overpopulation doesn't have to be the issue, and, or, and together with environmental consideration, we need to take the environmental consideration strongly into consideration, but that we can do by simply moving away towards a the new concept of personhood and not going over the top by claiming, making the claim we should get rid of humanity altogether. But that's really sort of the my short response. Lots of more could be said. Um, yes. No, it just I, I'm intrigued because, as I said, I, I I really I found you know that quote that I took to me it, it, it must have a meaning. Obviously, I mean it's, uh, it's you know it's the last page, so intuitively. Uh, so let alone that I completely agree with you, uh, I'm, I'm not willing to, to buy the argument that we should basically, we should hope for, for our own disappearance. But wanting it or not, I think we will need to put, or maybe actually we've already done, perhaps not you know, in humane ways, but we put some caps on our reproduction. Overpopulation is an issue, as you say, it might be the case that um, increasing our cognitive abilities, our level of education, our richness more broadly, uh, could be a viaticum to avoid overpopulation. But we also have, because you talk about politics too, you know, we should move the sphere into politics. Well, for example, here in Italy, as you might well know, you know, in, in the recent month, there has been this call for inverting demography. So, you know, there is this call, uh, you know, let's arm ourselves and you know, let's produce kids. Okay. And I say this as, as a non father. Uh, so, um, I guess that when I see the numbers that uh, tell us, even if there is a projection of more optimism, that in some part of the world, the average lifespan is maybe a little bit more than my age. And then I, I think some techniques might allow us to live 200 years. I see a little bit of an issue because I, if I make it global, let, never mind the, the actual impact that obviously if we would keep on growing as fast as we have done, uh, we would have. Uh, embracing the, te the, the technology uh, would be problematic. If uh, uh, unless, unless, and that's why I think that the parabiosis example is very interesting, unless the trick is to claim that it is for everyone, and personally I'm a bit critical of this technique, claiming that it is for everyone, but in fact it's for the few. So in the case of the plasma exchange, assuming that it works, it just physiologically is not feasible. It will not be possible for everyone to engage into this plasma donation or selling, whatever you, uh, for all individuals. So eventually, if that works, plasma would be extremely valuable or, or not, depending if we can clone it or not. I mean, reproduce it differently or not, um, and so forth and so on. So I think that this is attention that interests me. And uh, I wonder, I mean, now I wonder, I, I guess that it does interest you too. Otherwise, you wouldn't have, you know, 
put that uh, on, on the matter. Uh, and then briefly, I would be interested if you have also the answer for the short one, the first one, then. Uh, yeah. yeah, excellent. No, I mean, I consciously, oh, you, you're right. I consciously put that there. I also consciously put Nigeria with the exception, uh, with the example of like a 50 years average lifespan. But in order to actually to show, well, 200 years, 150 years ago in, 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 in the UK, we've had a lifespan of 40 years. So even in, a, in one of the, you know, among the least developed countries in the world nowadays, we've got a higher life expectancy than in the developed country 150 years ago. And that is the consequence of technological innovations and progress by implementing hygiene, you know, old education, school education, and so on. Um, and, and obviously, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not that everyone benefits immediately from the technological innovations. But just look, if, if you look at specific examples, you can see sort of who has, who has access sort of to um, HIV treatments. And it used to be like 10% 15 years ago. Now it's more than it's two thirds of all the HIV positives in the world who have access. That's not a perfect solution, obviously. But, you know, we, we are getting there. This is being worked on. And um, so uh, is the technology initially the, 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 the privilege, the more financially developed will have benefit from it. But then we take care of and the things are getting cheaper and it's being made available and we take care of it because it's important. And 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 and, and so um, we, innovation is needed technologically and management. And then as a consequence, also the distribution. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm not a libertarian. Um, we need to, you know, social justice is, is just a fundamental issue um, um, uh, which needs to be taken into consideration. And that directly leads me actually to the first question which you, you raised concerning. Um, I don't aim for, and also the question obligation concerning vaccinations uh, and so on. Um, um, I, don't, I don't think any pol or any political philosophy which aims for a perfect state for utopia is is bound to lead to totalitarian implications and is is, is bound to sacrifice the present for the future i'm non-utopian i don't yeah we've had too many and in, in sort of the german history alone we've had too many problematic you know not only problematic terrible implications of what what you know, totalitarian orientations have led to. So this is something which we need to fight for. We need to take individual rights into individual rights and negative freedom into consideration. This plurality of flourishing is an enormously important achievement, and and the need to fight against paternalistic and totalitarian structures. And that also and that means um, sort of at the same time we need to recognize that having that recognition of the importance of plurality is actually of a fairly recent origin. It's something which is still not shared in many parts of the world, sort of that plurality, democ liberal democracy, and so on. But it's an incredibly important achievement which we, for which we've been fighting for. Um, so that is actually at the center of, of my political reflections. So we always need to take that negative freedom as a central achievement into consideration but that can have different implications in different settings. And that's why I need, it's a dynamic as good as it gets politics. So we need to see what the implications are. If, if, if focusing on freedom you know, leads to libertarian high separation between the rich and the, and the poor, that could still focus on negative freedom, but then it undermines, freedom undermines itself because actually the ones who are less well up, their possibility of making changes are basically being removed. They are being practically forced to do something they don't want to do. And that's why too much focus on negative freedom undermines negative freedom. That's what I mean by negative, by, by dynamic, uh, dynamic um, politics, which still focuses on negative freedom. But sort of once the hierarchies are getting to back, we need to implement norms like equality, solidarity and so on much further in order. And the same applies actually to environmental issues. And, and in order to balance, but in the or in, in the end, it's it's the goal is to preserve freedom. In order to properly preserve freedom, we need to balance it with other issues like sustainability, equality, and solidarity. Um, because we've realized what a wonderful achievement uh, negative freedom is, and that it just absolutely needs. We need to avoid the coming about of any totalitarian and and paternalistic structures. So. 
Okay, I, I think my time is up. But, uh, <laughs> thank you again, you know, for for the nice exchange. The one, yeah, I, I think these are the absolutely important fundamental issues. Which thanks a lot. All right, um, and our last speaker uh, before our break is uh, Maurizio Balistreri, associate professor of moral philosophy at the University of Turin. Please. Thank you very much. I, I am really glad to be to be here, and uh, I would like to to thank you for for the invitation. Thanks, Stefan, for organizing this uh, wonderful, terrific session. On, uh, on your book. I have a PowerPoint that I will try to, to open. Just uh, one moment. Can you see me? Can you see the PowerPoint? Uh, it, it's not visible. You can uh, just click on share screen at the bottom of the screen, center bottom of the screen. Just share your screen and... Uh, share screen, will... share screen, yes. Now? No. When you have to click share screen, then just select from... Yes, I do your... it. Share screen, screen Not sharing. All. Because uh, Streamer has to show it, and I can't, I can't see it. Yes, uh, entire screen. Yeah, Maurizio, um, share screen, and then you need to select which part of the what you want to share. Is it the entire screen, or is it the document, or is it? You can also select several columns as part of the selection, and then once you've clicked that, it should be shared. I try just uh, okay. otherwise I can uh, maybe here. No, it doesn't so you work. Go to the share screen, then you go to the share screen. Yes, entire screen, Windows, Chrome, tab. But uh, or, or, or go to the maybe go to the that might be, um, yeah. Sorry, oh, for, uh, sorry for interfering. I mean, you you clicked on on the icon with the plus, right? Right at the at exactly share 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 screen. I thought maybe it has something. And then else. Uh, and then uh, I cannot uh, share. Okay, it's uh, it is not so important. No, you go to then you then you clear share screen again. And then you can either share the entire window or you go into the second column okay, of the okay. window. Okay. Okay. Yes, perfect. Sorry. Okay. Now you can see it. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, yes, it works. Now it works. Okay, perfect, perfect. So, thank you very much. Um, this is the starting point of my presentation. What is uh, transhumanism? And um, I am going to, to, to talk about uh, transhumanism and about the uh, differences between transhumanism and uh, posthumanism in uh, Stefan Sorgen, Sorgner's uh, uh, book. And um, so my goal is, uh, following uh, Stefan's uh, book, to understand what uh, transhumanism is. Uh, one key premise of transhumanism, um, Stefan says, is the desirability of becoming posthuman. Um, the majority of transhumanists uh, purport a mutual, materialistic, naturalistic, relational, or immanent understanding of the world. Uh, that is, uh, uh, from a uh, um, transhumanist uh, point of view, the theory of uh, evolution plays a central role in the understanding of uh, humanity. 
uh, transhumanists take evolution seriously. Uh, they strong think that uh, everything uh, has uh, evolved and uh, is likely to evolve, to change uh, again in the future if um, it doesn't die out uh, uh, first. And transhumanism embraces uh, the use of technologies. This is the relationship uh, with uh, technology. Technologies uh, can uh, help us to increase the likelihood that uh, post-human may emerge. And uh, according to transhumanism, we should strive towards uh, this goal, the overcoming of man, and the new technologies uh, can help us um, to reach this uh, uh, important uh, goal. And, um, and then uh, there are, among the, the, the transhumanists, uh, some uh, uh, open questions. Uh, is a post-human uh, still, uh, still human? And as we have said, uh, Nick Bostrom would say that uh, a post-human is still human, but uh, other transhumanists have uh, a different idea. They think that uh, post-humans are a new species. And uh, another option is that um, post-human is not longer a biological entity, but exists in a digital cyberspace. And then um, there is another question, important question, in the um, discussion among transhumanists, which technologies will produce uh, a post-human? And uh, there are, we have different uh, technologies uh, able to enhance uh, human beings, as uh, uh, we can uh, read in the Stefan Sorkin's uh, book, uh, medicine, drugs, uh, and uh, prosthesis, uh, uh, genome editing. And, um, and so it is a an open question which uh, technologies are most promising for increasing the likelihood of post-human emergence. And, uh, and then there is uh, the last question, which characteristics, uh, features are decisive um, for this project of creating, producing the post-human? And uh, it is also an open question which characteristics are decisive for an entity to be called uh, post-human. And uh, also in this case, we have different uh, options, superintelligence, a strong memory, a long lifespan, uh, a long health span, uh, a strong physiology, or um, morality. And then... Uh, then uh, um, Stefan Sortner uh, discusses uh, uh, posthumanism, and um, and uh, we are going to to see uh, the relationship between uh, uh, transhumanism and uh, posthumanism in uh, Stefan's book. Um, posthumanists um, say um, Stefan. Um, defend, uh, also defend uh, the concept of post-human. Uh, the concept of uh, post-human also plays an important role in uh, post-humanism. Uh, also, uh, the post-humans uh, uh, defend the desirability of becoming uh, post-human. Here, the idea is uh, that uh, human beings have always been uh, post-human and part of a gradual evolutionary process that have allowed us to develop from uh, our uh, common ancestors to the people uh, we are today. And uh, as you can um, read among uh, posthumanists uh, the concept of posthuman stance, um, Stefan says, for a new understanding of uh, humanity, whereby posthumanists also possess a special methodology and take up a continental European style of philosophizing as a way to formulate this new anthropology. Uh, 
As posthumans, we have always been dependent on technology, and there is no clear categorical distinction, uh, according to the posthumans, between nature and culture, body and soul, or genetic and environmental influences. And so the posthumanist attempt to transcend categorical dualities goes uh, beyond this concern and also suggests a revision of the traditional relationship between humans and animals, humans and digital and mechanical machines, and between nature and culture. The attempt to transcend categorical dualities is only one aspect of uh, uh, posthuman. Posthumanism. Uh, Posthumanists try to resolve uh, categorical dualities within statements based on considerations of the relationship between technology and human beings. Posthu uh, human beings have always been posthuman. Um, we cannot understand human without uh, the relationship with uh, technology and the other uh, living entities. And then uh, there is uh, uh, the, the, the issue of true. Another important theme of posthumanism concerns the concept of true. Posthumanist thinkers believe that we cannot expect to arrive at truth that uh, corresponds with reality, since this goal cannot be achieved in a, a plausible, plausible way. And, uh, mm, and so, I try to summarize uh, uh, the, um, the relationship between uh, posthumanism and transhumanism, uh, starting from uh, the commonalities, the um, similarities. This brief description of posthumanism and transhumanism shows that uh, both um, move beyond traditional humanistic anthropology, that is, beyond any theory that considers humans to consist of material and uh, immaterial um, aspect, uh, aspects. And then uh, there are some differences uh, in uh, language, style, and methodology, uh, origin, and uh, genealogy. Um, transhumanists have a linear way of thinking, use technical terms, and mostly um, fall back on scientific methodology. Posthumanists, on the other hand, have a nonlinear way of thinking, Stefan says, uh, use metaphorical terms and have a hermeneutic methodology. And then uh, transhumanists are deeply rooted in English tradition, which is closely linked to Darwinism theory of evolution and Mills utilitarianism. On the contrary, posthumanists are part of the continental philosophical tradition and closely connected with literary theory and cultural studies. According to uh, Stephens, um, we have to um, overcome both um, perspectives, uh, uh, posthumanism and transhumanism. Uh, the issue of becoming posthuman has to be analyzed and uh, addressed uh, within a meta-humanism, uh, humanist, meta-humanist uh, point of view. Um, what is um, meta-humanism? It champions weak version of uh, posthumanism and transhumanism um, as. Uh, um, Sven uh, said, strives to establish a relation and a dialogue between both discourses and at the same time represent an alternative to them. Metahumanism it surpasses a dualistic conception of uh, humanism but it also occupies a position between posthumanism and transhumanism. So uh, metahumanism is not reducible uh, to the previous perspective. It's neither transhumanism 
nor posthumanism. Metahumanist thinking lies behind a dualistic understanding of uh, uh, humanism, uh, just as it lies between posthumanism and transhumanism. Metahumanism also moves between posthumanism and transhumanism, however, by addressing posthumanism and transhumanist challenges using a hermeneutic method inspired by Vatimus weak thinking, is pensiero debole, and applies it to the current challenges of the latest technologies. I have at, at this point, I have some, some questions. I try to summarize um, my, um, my point of view on uh, um, Stefan's book uh, in, in some questions. Um, is metahumanism a form of uh, uh, posthumanism? Uh, is metahumanism only posthumanism applied to bioethics and to question concerning the ethics of new reproductive technology, genome editing, and other important uh, uh, issues uh, discussed in the uh, bioethics field? Which is your, your position, Stefan? And uh, um, what is? This is another question for you, Stefan. What is the conception of ethics that uh, metahumanism defends or should um, defend? Uh, what do you mean by a non formal conception of uh, ethics? Because uh, uh, you say that, in contrast to the domin dominant transhumanist concept of uh, perfection, Metahumanism represents the radical plurality of good, which implies that a non formal conception of good must always be implausible. So, what do you mean by a non formal conception of ethics? And do you think that uh, transhumanists who come from a utilitarian tradition could accept this uh, uh, conception? Of, uh, of ethics, and then I have uh, um, uh, other two, two questions. Do you mean that, uh, uh, do you think that transhumanists have to become uh, posthumanist and uh, to accept uh, another conception of, uh, of ethics? You say that transhumanists emphasize the importance of reason and uh, um, a form of truth. You say that apply reason can still be regarded as useful, but not because it is able, because reason is able to bring us into contact with truth. So um, do you think that uh, transhumanists have to uh, accept this uh, dualistic uh, uh, view of, uh, of knowledge? And the last question, is about uh, um, about reason. Um, it seems that uh, transhumanists, uh, metahumanists, posthumanists accept the value and the importance of reason, but uh, can't philosophers who refer to human tradition also be uh, transhumanist? Um, because according to Hume. Uh, reason is slave and uh, uh, must be slave of the passions. And so it seems that uh, we can, uh, we could have uh, human trans um, transhumanist. Um, what, what do you think uh, about? And, uh, and this was my last uh, uh, slide. Thank you very much. And uh, please, Stefan. Many, many thanks for so well summarizing sort of that approach while moving towards metahumanism. Um, I will start with the first, sort of the issue you raised concerning is you wonder is, is, is sort of metahumanism just uh, um, posthumanism applied to bioethics? And I, I clearly need to say this is not the case because. Um, 
because posthumanism, as I mentioned earlier, well, posthumanism usually affirm a relational ethics. And it, in, in recent recent ethical, uh, in various debates, actually, many raise relational ethical approaches, moving away from sort of moral status questions, personal dignity questions, and so on. And, um, and so it seems to me, I, I'm sharing the relationalism of critical post-humanism with respect to ontological issues. When it comes to ethics, I, 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 I definitely disagree. I don't, I don't think a relational ethics is a, good, it's a, it's a good solution because any relational ethics has to imply paternalistic structures. And I can, I can explain this to you with risk. Maybe it, it comes out most clearly by reference to a specific example. So we've got relational ethical accounts are uh, very often part of traditional religious accounts, like Confucianist and Chinese philosophical accounts. And actually, it, it was also integrated into the Chinese social credit system. Um, there was a case um, recently where um, there was a young boy who wanted to, who, who passed the university entrance exams. So he should have been allowed to study at university. But he was not, he was not allowed to do so because his father, for other, for other issues, didn't pay back a debt he had made earlier. So the low social credit rating of his father had an effect on the recognition, on the standing, on, on the rights, on what, what is the young, young boy allowed to do. And this is, that's a good example of any kind of relational account. You don't value for what you have done. You don't count for what you have done. Your relevance is part of the relationships you have with the others. You are the son of, you're the uncle of, you're the mother, you're the father of someone. So the relevance, your consideration is always a part, is, is, is based upon the relationships you have. And so here in the case, the young boy was not allowed to study, even though he had passed all the exams, um, just because his dad didn't pay back the debts. And this reveals the implications and the challenges associated to any relational ethical approach. Um, with basically, one is not being judged by who one is as a person. And that's why I'm, I, I, don't, I, I think these paternalistic implications are not something which we want. We want to be judged on what we have done, not what our ancestors have done, what our parents have done, and so on. We want to be judged on what we have done. You know, sisters might be mass murderer, but you you're not. You don't want to be judged on that basis. That's why I think any attempt of realizing a relational ethical approach, as it's been suggested in critical posthumanism, is actually highly dangerous. Is highly and it leads to paternalistic structures, which we really want to avoid. That's why I'm not a critical post-humanist when it comes to ethical questions. Um, when it comes to ontological issues, it's it's a an anthropo anthropological one. I'm I'm in agreement. I I'm, I share this understanding. But with ethical questions, I, I I'm I'm not. It is I'm I'm trying to. I'm arguing in favor of a non-anthropocentric account, but that doesn't lead you to a relational account. That leads you to a personhood for non-human animals. And that's as good as it gets. It's not a perfect solution, but that's what we all, you know, I guess ought to aim for. Not something, not something um, which works in all different circumstances, we always need to adapt and be flexible. That's what comes with it by moving away from any kind of platonic understanding, which, which you know, knows the real answer to all, all the questions. May I interrupt, yes, uh, Stefan? Because we could say there are different ways of being in relation and so, um, and so we could say ethics are to do with um, the capacity of uh, choosing uh, a way that we consider uh, right. And so, um, if the answer is uh, uh, the relation, um, 
I could uh, have different form of relations and, uh, uh, and uh, I have to, um, to choose one form of relation that uh, I think is better than other form of relations. I'm not quite sure. Could you say a bit more about that? I'm not quite <laughs> sure of what yeah. I, I mean, I can be in relation with uh, other people in different ways. Mm. And, and so I have to, to consider the right way of being in, in a relation. And uh, I could say this is uh, the ethics field. I mean, I recognize that there are other people and I try to have uh, uh, a good connection with them, the right connection. Mm. But it is a, a, a big question, I understand. But it, yeah, of course, I mean, it, it doesn't make a difference in which type of relationship you are, but concerning the recognition, the respect you deserve, the duties you have, the obligations, um, and how you want to be treated, shouldn't that still depend rather on you as an entity? Even though there is no you, there is no, nothing unchanging human nature. It's dissolved. That's that, clearly human nature is gone. However, um, sort of the respect you deserve, the duties you have, they shouldn't depend on the relations. Because once they get introduced, um, then, then someone, as I said, the young boy has different obligations, suddenly does not get accepted even though he should have been. And that's why I think there is a lot of to be said in favor of um, sort of such a basis of personhood ethics, but it's not a personhood ethics in the sense of the person is an essentialist conception. We always need to adapt what count, who counts as a person, what counts as harming as a person. That's a very difficult question. And, 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 and it, it probably also needs to be decided upon the time we live in, on the situation we live in. Um, and, and there's a sufficient amount of discussion to be, go, uh, to be, to be done in that respect. But it, you shouldn't have different obligations just because you're the son of, or the brother of, or the sister of someone else. That's sort of, that's why I'm not sharing with the critical post-humanist. And, and it, it just as a, maybe a further aspect, which um, I, I wish to highlight is, and, and that goes back to the pensiero debole, the weak thinking. There is sort of this hostility between members of, members of these two, two, two cultural movements. And it, it all you it often goes along with a, like like a lot of violence in their way of expressing, like you are the basically you know saying to members of the other group you know that you are the evil one we need to fight against, and 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 and, and I regular I mean I've organized events on meeting critical post and transhumanists for more than ten years, and and you regular regularly see that even though both claim to move away in towards a non dualist account. But there is such a lot of violence associated with the way here one presumes of one's own superiority, which is not justified by the philosophical stance one originally has concerning the you know rejection, the doubt concerning any any foundationalist absolute answers, and that should really lead to sort of a self a distant a self distanced stance towards one's own understanding, realizing. I might be wrong, you might be right. And I don't know, maybe I'm wrong on what I said about relational ethics, but I, so far, no one has been able to explain that to me properly, I get maybe, you know. I'm open to that. So I'm entering in, into the discourse and I want to hear more about that. Um, and I, I'm trying to explain it as clearly as I can. And, 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 and there are some other elements actually where Unfortunately, that just as an example of where that openness does not apply, it's just when I uh, hear the, the presentations, normally a critical posthumanists presenting transhumanists, and well, these are the guys of uh, the guys who just want to um, get their minds uploaded, get their minds uploaded, um, and then become immortal. That's the summary of transhumanism. And then they say why that is wrong, and I just. Yeah. It's 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 oh, you, very often a persiflage of a platitude what you can show on the title page of a cover page instead of really engaging in a dialogue and then they say well isn't that's just um, humanism on stereotypes that type of transhumanism is hyperhumanism 
it is not it is i mean just just taking on on a if you if you engage if you analyze the situation clearly you show um and, and i'm i'm very critical concerning the possibility of mind uploading i don't think it will happen within a short period of you know maybe in the distant future i'm not excluding the possibility but it's not hyperhumanism in the sense of because humanism was the understanding that there was an, a, a, an immaterial mind and a material body. And, and tra most transhumanists thought from a naturalist account, which already makes clear um, sort of we do have a mind because we can speak, but, but it has to be something which is empirically accessible in the same way as the body is empirically accessible. They're two aspects of the same thing. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not in, so even, and even mind uploading in a computer would be that, um, would not be that suddenly the mind becomes immaterial, but the, simply the mind becomes code, becomes electricity in the end, becomes a series of, of ones in series in a computer. Whether that's possible or not, it's, it's a different question, but it remains part of the empirically accessible world. That's why there's a clear difference between, there's still an embodiment with respect to, mind uploading within transhumanism, which would not be there in, in a Christian um, moving to the, of the soul um, moving into the imperial realm. And that's why I, I just pledged for a bit more carefulness, less violence and more openness to discourse rather than just slagging the other off in, in with platitudes, which, which are often not philosophically very well founded. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> Thank you, Maurizio. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for that very interesting uh, debates all around. We will now go on a break and we will return in uh, an hour. See you then.